to the next level. So, you know, that was my reason for kind of falling in love with this material. It's something that I, um, I've found now in so many books, even books not written by anybody associated with KW, I'll often find the threads of these six personal perspectives. And I was intrigued on how this course kind of came together. And initially Gary Keller, who was doing a lot of teaching and training because he'd moved out of the CEO role, he was doing a lot of teaching and training. And as Gary is wont to do, the founder of KW, you, you see him, he's writing all the time, right? And he had a, an accumulation of all these um, easel and, and um, um, uh, I guess flip charts and he had them all in his house and he decided to review them one day and he realized there's a there's a content here that could really go into some serious training so instead of taking thoughts that were that he had discovered and found and researched he started putting it all together and he created these kind of training materials and um, I want you guys to understand when you're listening in on this just breathe this is um, this is information that Gary has um, pulled together. He's done the research. Um, and this is the perspectives that he's discovered in top, um, top level performers. And he's, that's who he spends most of his time around is he's constantly, he's kind of like a team leader in a sense. He's always masterminding with the best of the best, not only within our industry, but outside of it. And so he's kind of found these things and it's up to you to decide how to make use of them, and how you can incorporate some of these tools um, that work. And they work for others. The question is, will they work for you? And that's going to be up to you. Now, having said that, um, it's, it's Wednesday, it's mid-January. Um, and while we're kind of in the middle of a lockdown or just starting a lockdown, I know you guys have all kinds of demands on your time. What made you decide to get signed up for this course in particular? And, and what are you hoping to gain from it? What would you like to walk away from uh, in, in two hours, in two and a half hours? What do you want to come away with? To, you can say, this was time well invested for me. Just unmute or use the chat box. Take our time, guys. I really like to get as much engagement as possible. So um, feel free to share. Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> we're still, we're, we're, I think, I, I think some people are, are still waking up a little okay. bit. Let's start uh, with you, Irene. Actually, what, what would have uh, prompted you to want me to have this, you know, discussed and shared uh, this early in the year? What was your hope that it would do for the associates in the office? As you've taken six, six personal perspectives, you've you live it. Um, what was your hope that uh, delivering this content uh, to kick off the year would, would do for your agents? That's, that's actually a great question, Stephen. Thank you. And uh, an easy one to answer. We do spend an awful lot of time on uh, teaching lead generation, how to take care of our clients, uh, how to do better, how to sell more, how to, how to, how to, how to. And uh, we don't always spend a lot of time on the uh, how to be and what to be. And I think that's really, really important because it all starts, you know, it all starts out here and in here. And uh, if you don't have your, uh, your, your priorities set uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, um, then it doesn't matter what you do in the business. And, um, you know, you might have some, some short-term success, um, but you need, you need to go from the inside to, uh, to do something long-term. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that says a lot there. What, what are you hoping to get from this, um, guys? What, what would be a, a sentence, a word? Um, is it clarity? Is it um, just a reboot? What do you hope to gain from being in the session today? Because I want to make sure, um, you know, it's not my goal um, ever to be the sage on the stage. It's kind of to be the guide on the side. And I want to help you guys kick in and discover the information and get something out of it for you. And so I wanna to teach to you guys as opposed to any agenda around how the curriculum is supposed to be taught. Um, what do you wanna get from today? Oh, Roy had a good line, had a good comment. He's coming in blind. He has no idea what he's walking into and uh, he's, he's keeping an open mind and paying attention. Do you know what, Roy? I'm, I have to thank you for that because to me, that's a, that's a testament uh, to your trust in me and in our market center and, and the information that we provide to you. So I'm, 
Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know for don't screw up, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, uh, we might have some ideas coming up. Everybody's being shy and quiet. Uh, Donna says to get some tips on organizing and prioritizing. Do you know what, Donna? I think that's awesome because when you have everything clear in here, it's a lot easier to get it organized physically. So Absolutely. I think, yeah. Great input. All right, let's dive in. And uh, now by now, have some of you been able to download the manual yet? Anybody's got it? A few of you yes. might have it. It was a there in the chat, chat. Box. yeah. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just read a section that's in the manual. Uh, it's just at the bottom, bottom of page seven, and it's um, the mindset is key by Gary Keller. And Gary has said when you interview the very top people and ask them what their biggest challenge is, invariably they will tell you it is mindset, keeping it strong focused and positive amid the many challenges they encounter every day on their way to the top. Gary continues, life is an inside to the outside experience. When you get this at a deep level, you realize what you were, uh, who you are inside determines and drives what you are outside. The very best achievers know this and therefore truly work on it and protect their mindset. Um, would you guys agree right now, like even today, today would have been a day where your mindset could have been challenged. Would you agree there's a lot of different messages coming at you? Right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially at times like these, we are finding that there's definitely a lot of competition for for our mindset. And we can we can spend a little too much time online or a little too much time watching the news or reading the paper. And it, it can really leave you deflated. And yet you could, you know, I was in meetings all day yesterday and I didn't, my head didn't come up till like five and I looked at my phone and there's a few agents that texted me that said, are we still okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought, oh man, I hope the market center is not on fire. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I knew there was something coming up today, but I didn't know. And when I read through all the changes, there wasn't really a yeah. significant shift for us as agents. No. Um, no. and so I realized I could see how, if I hadn't, uh, just been focused on what was most important to me, I could have somebody dictate where my head was going to go. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest things when Gary's talking about mindset attitudes, um, they meld together because they definitely impact your approach to life. And, um, we're going to work on, um, six different key sets, um, to really get a feel for that. Um, so I'm just going to jump ahead to um, the six pers perspectives, just so you know uh, what we mean by that. So we're going to talk about committing to self-mastery, which is really that ongoing commitment to I'm going to nail it, I'm going to master it. And we're going to talk about some techniques that can help you on that journey. Like it's one thing to know what it is and one thing to say it, but it's like, how do I go about committing to self-mastery? The second thing would be really being committed to the 80-20 principle. It is so common for high achievers to get so much done because everything matters equally and they just have such a strong bandwidth to get so many things done that they're successful despite their inability to say yes to the few things that matter most. They could really live a bigger life and have a higher dollar per hour if they identified a lot more of the 80-20 principle and what they were doing. So we'll spend a good chunk on that as well as moving from E to P, which is, um, sorry, uh, I'm purposeful about breaking through my ceiling of achievement. Like if you're good with where everything's at right now in your life and you're like, just, it's good. You're not hitting your head on a, a ceiling of achievement because you're not actually like going up then you don't need to actually um, do anything different. Like you're good. You can actually leave now. Like you can, like, if you just want to like stay the same <laughs> and, and just sort of go with the flow uh, and there's okay. Like there's some happy people that I know that are just stagnant. 
um, they're oblivious, but they're stagnant. If you're looking <laughs> for growth and improvement, so um, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, let me give you an example. You know, sometimes we look at our goals, right? And we're like, I got to go from 300 in GCI to half a million in GCI. I want to go from half a million to 750 in GCI. There's a point of return in your income level where more money actually decreases the quality of your life. Because what you're doing to make that money isn't making your life better. It could be making you unhealthy, could be straining relationships, it could be lowering the quality of the business you're doing, um, any number of things. So we have to look at that vector and we have, to, it's like class sizes, right? There's usually a sweet spot for class sizes but too big has challenges and too small also has challenges. So we have to learn where that sweet spot is. So often when we're looking at our goals, especially when you use an E to P concept, it might be the thing that says, well, I'm gonna make more money this year, but I'm gonna work less. So I'm gonna increase my dollar per hour. If I work 50 hours a week, 50 weeks a year and work 2,500 all, 2, hours, to make 300 grand, who would agree that if somebody could make 280,000 but work half the time, they'd be making more per hour. Mm, absolutely. Now they're not making as much, but I would say they're a higher income earner. I think the other person gets the badge for the hard worker award. Does that make sense? So yeah. we hand those out usually in March, those awards, the hard worker awards because we really can't identify what the dollar per hour is for each person. Does that make sense? So don't get caught up in your goals being tied into an, an amount. Make sure they're tied into efficiency. And we're gonna go through that from E to P to maybe talk about where are there some things where you can do things more effectively. Uh, we're gonna make learning-based uh, really a foundation of your action plan. So as opposed to, um, you know, sometimes we learn in buckets. And like, we just know we have to do it. And so we go and we sign up for this class, for instance. What we want to do is we want to ensure that learning is built into a day-to-day. -day. There's a lear learning component to each day. That there's a little bit of learning going on at all times. And that's where you're going to get far more growth than you would if you just had a bucket blocked off. I'm going to go three seminars a year. I'm going to read one book a year. Um, at this time when I go to the, to, to the cottage this summer, uh, as opposed to other tips that make it be, you be a learning based individual. I'll give you some tricks and tips on that that you might be able to integrate without really setting aside big blocks of time and you'll still get the learning in. Um, we're going to do some exercises around removing limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs get in the way um, so often um, from us maybe being working on the best version of ourselves. And uh, if you, you know, it's, it's like everyone has a desire to grow into a better person, but it's like, we need to arm you with the tools that might give you the questions you need to ask yourself so that you can identify, am I making progress towards that? And then the last part is just about being accountable. It's really just about you owning it. So before we get into this challenge, I'm going to attempt something that I've never done before. I'm gonna share a video with you and hopefully you can hear it. So Irene, Donna, when we start, if the, the sound is on, just give me a thumbs up. Okay. And if it's not, just do this. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. So let me just try this one second here. I'm going to get into this mode. This is so exciting. You guys are witnessing a first. So I'm going to make this huge play. Oh, stop share. Okay, this is exciting. This is live TV. Now we're going to hit play. But first, I just got to make sure I got the volume turned on. So one second here, folks. Now, Andy's probably laughing on the other end here going, wow. Oh, I could do this in a heartbeat, says Andy. <laughs> oh, I find it entertaining. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Hang on a second. Portion. No, I'm just going to do basic and we're going to do share sound. And here we go.
imagine a big explosion as you climb through 3,000 feet. Imagine a plane full of smoke. Imagine an engine going clack, 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 clack. Sounds scary. Well, I had a unique seat that day. I was sitting in 1D. I was the only one who could talk to the flight attendants. So I looked at them right away, and they said, no problem. We probably hit some birds. The pilot had already turned the plane around, and we weren't that far. You could see Manhattan. Two minutes later, three things happen at the same time. The pilot lines up the plane with the Hudson River. It's usually not the route. <laughs> he turns off the engines. Now imagine being on a plane with no sound. And then he says three words, as unemotional three words as I've ever heard. He says, brace for impact. <gasps> I didn't have to talk to the flight attendant anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I could see in her eyes. It was terror. Life was over. And I want to share with you three things I learned about myself that day. I learned that it all changes in an instant. We have this bucket list. We have these things we want to do in life. And I thought about all the people I wanted to reach out that I didn't. All the fences I wanted to mend. All the experiences I wanted to have and I never did. As I thought about that, later on I came up with a saying, which is, I collect bad wines. Because if the wine is ready and the person is there, I'm opening it. I no longer want to postpone anything in life. And that urgency, that purpose, has really changed my life. The second thing I learned that day, and this is as we um, clear the George Washington Bridge, which was by not a lot. <laughs> I thought about, wow, I really feel one real regret. I've lived a good life in my own humanity and mistakes. I've tried to get better at everything I've tried. But in my humanity, I also allow my ego to get in. And I regretted the time I wasted in things that did not matter with people that matter. And I thought about my relationship with my wife, with my friends, with people. And after, as I reflected on that, I decided to eliminate negative energy from my life. It's not perfect, it's a lot better. I've not had a fight with my wife in two years. It feels great. I no longer try to be right. I choose to be happy. The third thing I learned, and this is as your mental clock starts going 15, 14, 13, you can see the water coming. I'm saying, please blow up, right? I don't want this thing to break in 20 pieces like you've seen in those documentaries. And as we're coming down, I had a sense of, wow, dying is not scary. It's almost like we've been preparing for it our whole lives. But it was very sad. I didn't want to go. I love my life. And that sadness really framed in one thought, which is, I only wish for one thing. I only wish I could see my kids grow up. About a month later, I was in a performance by my daughter, first grader, not much artistic talent, <laughs> yet. <laughs> and I'm bawling, I'm crying like a little kid. And it made all the sense in the world to me. I realized at that point, by connecting those two dots, that the only thing that matters in my life is being a great dad. Above all, above all, the only goal I have in life is to be a good dad. I was given the gift of a miracle of not dying that day. I was given another gift, which was to be able to see into the future and come back and live differently. I challenge you guys that are flying today Imagine the same thing happens on your plane, and please don't. But imagine, and how would you change? What would you get done that you're waiting to get done because you think you'll be here forever? How would you change your relationships and the negative energy in them? And more than anything, are you being the best parent you can? Thank you. Sniff, sniff. So, um, wow. I want you to just think on that experience for a moment. First of all, I don't think telling that to a bunch of people who are going to hop on a plane later that day is a great, <laughs> it's a great pick me up. But um, maybe if I just arrived in town, it might be good. But 
Uh, I know you're all flying out today. Let me tell you a story. Um, but here's the thing. This is a little bit like, well, what do you really want to use real estate for? What's, what's, what's it going to be the fulcrum uh, to, to do the heavy lifting in your bigger life goals? So on page 11, it asks you in the manual, so you can either uh, jot this down on your computer or in your notes, or if you're writing something down, just jot down three things that you'd like to accomplish in your life. And they could be uh, real estate related, non-real estate related. It could be a hobby that you wanted to take up or get better at. It could be something you not yet done that you still have an interest in accomplishing. Um, take a stab at identifying three things that you would like to accomplish in your life. Take a moment and just write that out and bring you all back on in a minute or two. Um, and it could be something, it may be who you want to become. Maybe you've always wanted to become a big brother, a volunteer at the hospital. Uh, maybe you've wanted to be involved at the food bank. Maybe you want to um, learn an instrument, um, take singing lessons, uh, learn to bake, learn to say no to baking, um, whatever <laughs> it is, whatever achievement. Maybe you want to run a marathon. Maybe you want to walk five kilometers every day. What are some of the things that have yet to be done that you want to do. Are we starting to get a list of two or three items? What I want you to drill down on now is what's one thing in that list of one or two, three things that you may have written down that would be a priority that you know if you accomplish that, it would lead to something significant. So this can be looked at from two ways. There could be a big thing that you want to accomplish, but there could be like a small thing that will lead to a big result. It could be like getting over my fear of rejection could totally change my real estate career. And if I could double my income and half the time I spend in real estate, because I just learned to get over myself and the fear of hearing a no, could I spend more time at home, earn more money, so much money that I don't need it all, come from abundance and create a bigger life just by getting over that hurdle of just getting over that, that I, I feel I can't handle rejection. I don't like to hear no. Being worried about what they may think. That's what I mean. So this could be something big, like... I want to complete a marathon in every continent. I want to visit all continents on the planet. I'd like to, like, it could be something big that almost takes a whole lifetime to accomplish, or it could be something almost barely noticeable that would have a big impact. And then identify which one of those things is your biggest priority, because that's what we're going to work on in your six perspectives today will help you develop six personal perspectives around achieving that big goal or achieving that smaller goal that would lay the foundation for some big results to come. When I first came to KW, I, I with the good help of John Ferber, we tried to identify what was I good at, what did I enjoy doing, and what would somebody pay me money to do? Because if you can be in your sweet spot doing something you enjoy and somebody's paying you the, a, a, a substantial amount of money that justifies your investment of that time and you're, you're good at it and you're in your gift zone, what are the odds of you feeling pretty fulfilled? Well, when John kind of broke it down that to me that way, that's when I realized that my role was going to be beyond um, the day-to-day -day of selling. And it was a different role for me in my real estate career. All that selling I'd done for decades and decades was going to lead to something different for me 
And I can tell you, I'm, I'm more in my sweet spot now than I would have been five, six years ago when I first came to KW. So what is it you're, you're looking to do, looking to accomplish? Does anybody want to share what they may have written down or considered? You don't need to, you don't have to. I'm just curious if anybody had something that they've identified and it could be just, yes, I got something or yeah, I've, I've, I've always been wanting to do the following and I'm going to, I'm going to commit to that. And it's okay. We can, we, we have some time. We have a quiet bunch today, Stephen. <laughs> it's all right. They will open up. They will. Yeah, they will. All right. Well, let's, let's keep going. Okay. So would everyone use the chat box though and just let me know, have you at least pick something that you want to shoot for? Big or small, right or wrong? Because if you can identify that, then at least we know. So Roy would like to get published. It's awesome. So, so someone like Roy, there'll be a series of things that need to happen for that to take place. And through some of the exercises today, we can do that. You also want to get healthy. What if we could publish a book about getting healthy? You could Ooh. knock out two birds with one stone. <laughs> uh, is it Heidi? Heidi, yeah. Heidi, yeah, I would like to reach my number of projected transactions this year. Right. Um, and your number one party, great. Okay, these are great shares. Anybody else yeah. before I move along? Does anybody have a, a, a real identity, with, especially after listening to that video? Develop a strong real estate YouTube channel. Buy an income property, start creating wealth. Awesome, I love it. I'd like to add a second property south. You mean like downtown? <laughs> or somewhere you would eventually travel to, Donna? <laughs> down, yeah, down south. He's saying down south. <laughs> Definitely travel. Definitely travel, right? Um, Billy Parrot. Hey, Billy. Yeah, uh, it's great. Uh -huh. Making me reevaluate my priorities, where I live, et cetera. Yeah, I think COVID's done that for a lot of people, right? You know, it's funny. Um, I've been masterminding with a lot of our agents. And one of the things that they're going to come up with, I mean, we all know that some of the agents, one of their things that, that's probably taken over from open house and as a lead generation form or even door knocking where it hasn't been as easy to do or there's, there's some limitations over the last year. They've started doing information seminars and usually we do you know, downsizing seminar. We do a first time buyer and investor seminar. Some people are starting to get in touch with our KW agents in places like Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And we're having a seminar about relocating down east. Because there's a percentage of the population in the GTA that has roots in the east coast. And some of them are starting to rethink, well, man, if I could cash out, and seriously, you could cash out right now. And what would that do if I was living um, out there? And how would my life look? People live full lives out in the East Coast, right? Um, they have all kinds of things going on there, just like we have here. So I'm just saying, like, these are different ideas and different paradigms. And so sometimes it starts with, yeah, where do I really want to live? My goal this year might be to figure out where do I want to be and where do I want to live? We always, we never really thought about that in this context. Uh, and that's something that's come out of COVID too, for sure. So you've got that goal. Even yeah. Sorry, before you go on, uh, if I could share something, I was on the Sam sure. Malik script practice this morning and uh, we were talking about, you know, yes, you can sell your house for a lot of money, um, but if you don't know what you're going to use that money for, like what's the point of selling the house? And uh, it's the, this is sort of strikes me as, as similar is, yeah, everybody wants to make more money, but for what? What are you going to use it for? And is it the money that you want to make or is it what, is, what it's going to do for you? And what is that thing that you can achieve by having more money? Because if that thing isn't strong, like the money doesn't really matter. Yeah, money is much anyway. Yeah, money is just a monetary measuring stick that usually identifies um, when you've hit a certain series of numbers and productions, but it's not necessarily tied into fulfillment. A lot's exactly. going to depend on what did that do for me and did I have it come about the right way? Did, did I come out the other end feeling good, right? So um, 
let's jump in. I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint without sharing the sound using the portion of the screen. And then I'm just going to play this and you guys are in business. You can all see that okay? Yeah. So um, Gary uses a, Gary Keller uses a saying called get real, get set, take action, don't quit. Unfortunately, without us really getting real, the get set, the take action, don't quit can send you off in all kinds of directions. So what is your goal? It's like, it's such an easy question, right? What is your goal? It's the answer that can be a little tricky. So I want you to kind of identify, and for those of you that have the manual, it, it's kind of clear in the manual, but it sort, sort of shows up this way. We're gonna have four circles on a page and on the very top, I just want you to think, okay, what's your goal? And write it in that circle. So take the time to do that right now. And I, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Nobody in the classroom is looking over your shoulder right now. And there's also no right or wrong. I think that's really important to remind yeah. people of. Absolutely. Now the question is, in the next circle, how are you doing with your goal? You could do that on a scale of one to 10. You could do that, um, you know, I'm 70% there. Okay. So you know your goals and we, we, know, we know how we're doing. So we've identified the progress we're make, making. How do you feel about that progress? How do you feel about where you're at? And the last question would be, what will your future look like if you do not achieve your goal? Now, if everything's gonna be fine, whether you achieve, whether you hit that goal or not, then it's probably not a real goal. It could just be a routine and it's kind of what you always do. Usually a goal has got to matter whether you hit it or not. Like I'll give you an example. When I decided I was going to run my first marathon, I set a goal. I said, I, I, I want to be able to qualify for Boston. Usually only a small percentage. I think it's somewhere between eight and 10% of people qualify to go participate in the Boston, like you got to qualify to get into that marathon. Only eight or 10% of people do so on their first attempt. So great. So what do I got to do? I've got to be, I got to be under three hours and 20 minutes. All right. So what would the time be like in my half marathon for me to know if I'm on track with that? All right. I know what I'm doing. I didn't just have a goal of participating or completing my goal was to complete it in a certain amount of time. And why did I want to do that? Because I was turning 40. I was diagnosed at 21 with stage four cancer that had spread to my left kidney, my right lung, my lymphatic system. And I just, you know, I was tired of having that in the back of my head, wondering, could it come back? Would it come back? Am I okay? Is this impact? I, I was just going to kick it to the curb. And I thought if I went out and run, a marathon and I ran the Boston, I would just kind of like leave that in the dust. And I thought, let's do that. That'll really, I'll feel good about that. And if I could also do it while still understanding I've got a, in 04, I would have had a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old and I had a vibrant real estate career. And I'm not necessarily a gifted athlete, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> um, so how do I get this done? So I started training for it. And um, all I could think of is as I was coming the last mile and I couldn't have my heart rate go down, <laughs> it, was, it was spiking. Even though I was slowing down, my heart rate was still going up and it was redlining and I had about a mile to go and I'm running out of gas. But but, but I knew I was going to hit that finish line unless I got hit by lightning and, you know, could have happened. Uh, I hit the finish line and uh, 
you know, I've got to love Chicago. Just a side note, if you're going to run a marathon and pick one, pick Chicago. Because I crossed the finish line, and after they gave me my medal and my wrap, they handed me the option of either two Milwaukee lights or old Milwaukee's, one of the two, the light or the regular version. And there was no wristband policy, and I didn't have to stay in a certain area. It's like, you know what? Have a beer. <laughs> you just did a marathon. Have a beer. <laughs> and my point is, I got through that because I set a series of goals that mattered. Mm -hmm. People say, well, why are you going to Chicago to run a marathon? We have a perfectly good marathon here in Toronto. At the time, I think we had two of them. You, you know, why are you going there? And I thought to myself, well, because it's flat and it's fast. And if I got to book a sitter and <laughs> uh, get on a plane and book a hotel and take time away from work. And, and, and I told everybody I was doing this marathon because they'd always wonder why is that the hockey rink in tights? It's like, well, I dropped the kids off for practice. I didn't need to watch them skate circles. I went for a run and then I picked them up after. So I got a lot of my training runs on. I loved it when the kids had a two hour practice. It was like, great, I could get a long run in. So my point is I had specific goals that mattered for a certain reason. And that's why right now, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, pick a goal and I, I, we're gonna run through these exercises because you're going to need to know how am I doing with that goal? How do I feel about that? And what would your future look like if you didn't achieve your goal? Now, my future wasn't going to be bleak if I didn't qualify for Boston on my first marathon. So, you know, take all that with a grain of salt. But the last thing I wanted to do is finish that marathon with probably sore knees and a sore back and tired for weeks because it was at the maximum of my ability and miss it by like two minutes or five minutes. Oh, let's do it again. I wanted to do it once and get it over with. Right. So what, what was the, the Stephen, what was the qualifying time? Just out of curiosity. I ran a 317. Wow. And there were three other Hanlins that ran in Chicago. There's 40,000 runners. I was the fastest Hanlin. <laughs> That's great. You know, it's kind of cool when you do those things because um, the best runners in the world are on the same course at the same time running the race. Same thing when I did some triathlons. It's kind of neat to see the best in the world, kind of like being in real estate where you're hanging out with some of the best realtors in the planet. They work in our GTA area, right? So um, you get to do offers with them. It's, it's neat to sort of be able to do that. I don't know if in a lot of professions, like I know as a hockey player, I never got up to go on the ice with you know, the pros, right? Um, so this mechanism of what is your goal? How am I doing? How do you feel about that? And what will your future look like? That bottom thing might identify that, you know, you could probably work on some bigger goals or it might really get you feeling like, man, I am stuck. I am stagnant. I am not making progress. I want to get published, but what am I doing about it? Am I setting aside a certain amount of time to write every day? Am I setting a certain amount of time aside to... Um, talk to whoever I need to talk to who might have interest in that. I'm just using that as an example because I thought I would think that's part of the process, right? Yeah. Cool. We'll be publishing my stuff. <laughs> um, so self-mastery. So self-mastery is the possession of great knowledge, skills, and habits that make you the master of you. So one of the key things when you know your goals, you've got to understand your strengths and weaknesses. It's kind of like putting a puzzle together. Now, again, they don't have this on the slides, but they do have it in the, um, in the manual. And I love the illustration that they give in the manual because it helps you identify strengths and weaknesses and then work towards your strengths. And we're going to jump into an exercise in a couple of minutes. And this is going to be a little challenge session for you to work on something together just to see if you could get used to the formula because it's this kind of formula that helps you commit to self-mastery. So essentially what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to identify a goal. Now in your manual, it says if your goal was to master prospecting, you'd identify your strength and your weakness. And in this case, they've identified that I, I'm great with people, but I'm uncomfortable bringing up business. And so what they do is they say, great. So the plan is I'm going to do script practice. 
I'm going to take bold when it comes to town, or in this case, when it comes online. And then I'll just start activating on that and call my sphere of influence. So what we have here is somebody who's set a goal because they realize that mastering pro prospecting will have them hit the targets. So if Janice wants to buy that investment property, or if somebody wants to buy something south, like sunny south, like Donna, then it could be that's why you want to master prospecting. So the goal isn't to master prospects. That's sort of like a subset of, I, I want to buy a house. That takes moolah. How am I going to do that? I just got to get better at these techniques. So we're now for some people, they could be okay with calling people they know, but they hate talking to strangers. And they're already good at getting business from their sphere, but they got to learn to get outside their comfort zone. But in this example, it's just, I'm good with people, I'm comfortable bringing up business. And the solution here is an action plan. So understand in the bottom, all three steps, script practice, take bold and call sphere of influence. Those are action items. So we get real, we get set, we take action and then don't quit. So the exercise is this. So we're gonna break out and this is gonna take us about five to 10 minutes, five minutes each. We're gonna work out into groups of, Andy, how many people are we gonna break out into? Are we gonna do three per room or four per room? Uh, we, we could do four per room. We have 23 participants at the moment, um, 21 do, excluding you and Irene. Let's do and, groups of three and we'll do seven groups of three. So here's the goal of this exercise. It's gonna take about 10 minutes. So you've got three minutes each. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify obstacles that might hinder you from getting your goal. So like Donna, what could sidetrack you from getting the production you need to have the funds available to buy that property? Okay, what are three obstacles? So your team is going to brainstorm around what those three obstacles are, or you might know what they are. The second question is going to be, and this is what's on page 23 in the manual, is you're just going to share what strengths you're bringing to the table and that will help you overcome those obstacles, and you're going to write them down. You're going to identify any weaknesses. So understand your, your obstacles and your weaknesses are different things. You're going to identify your weaknesses and then you're going to determine if the objects or the obstacles are movable. And do you have some strengths just because you're aware of your weakness that will help you develop a plan to get over those roadblocks. So, right. We identified the weakness was that you didn't like to get rejected by um, you didn't like to hear people, you know, say no to you. You didn't like to bring up business. You're uncomfortable bringing up business. So that was the weakness. So the way to get over that is just learn the right words to say and then take a program that'll create accountability and new habits like bold and then take action with your lead generation every day and, and get calling. So just to recap, you're going to write down your, your obstacles. You're going to identify your strengths. You're going to identify your, weak, your weaknesses. Mm. And you're going to come up with an action plan that could overcome those obstacles. Are we clear on the exercise? Do you, any questions on that? Just check it in the chat box. So if I put you in a room, you're not going to be staring at the person room going, what do we do? What do we do now? Stephen, I guess it does also, you need to know what your goal is uh, going into the breakout room, right? Yeah. Just, so the break yeah. time is going to be for about 10 minutes. If you don't have a goal and you're just not in the headspace to do this exercise, be a great coach or partner for whoever is and give them some ideas. I just want you to get comfortable with the idea that there's a plan to work on self-mastery. We're not going to master the rest of your life today or in this breakout room. I just want you to go through the exercise and you're going to get a feeling of, okay, this is a simple formula. Now, this is a formula Gary uses to build a company like Keller Williams. 
What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Right? He figures it out. What's going to get in the way? And he figures it out. So can we use the same formula? Sure. Okay. So Andy, if you want to make that all happen. Perfect. Rooms are opening up right now. Woo See you guys in 10 minutes. No sleeping, no napping. And we have two people who haven't joined their rooms as of yet. Okay, that's cool. They can they can stay out in our world. They may have joined in late or uh, not been able to get all this uh, information they needed to do it. So that's cool. Awesome. Welcome back. So uh, I was talking, I was muted. Um, I did that faux pas. <laughs> okay, that's okay. It's like one of those B movies, right? Um, all right. That was interesting. What did you, how'd you guys make out? Um, this is a great opportunity if you're shy to talk about anything you're working on, you can just tell us what your partner's working on and it's a lot easier sometimes. Um, what did you take away from this, this segment? Sorry, Roy, did you? Yeah, I'm just talking to myself. It was kind of cool that you can do that little room thing. <laughs> That's yeah. all. This whole Zoom thing is kind of new to me too. So, um, yeah. What did you? Uh, it was. It was, it was great. It was great. We 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 discussed prospecting, um, and you know, strengths and weaknesses and, and plans. So we, we did prospecting. It's very good. And you know what? If if you if you take, you know, if you take two or three of your own personal equities in your life, like health and finance and spirituality and stuff, and just do that, I can see the power in that. Absolutely. Okay. 
very easy. Quick little formula, get real, get set, take action. Ooh, and, I like that. Right? Get real, get set, take action. Yeah, because nothing works without the action, right? It's yeah. not about the knowing, it's about the doing. And sometimes these big things we want to do that are really important in our lives are nothing more than a series of minor habits and minor adjustments and tweaks to our mindset and considering it from different angle and lining up your dominoes until they create this big result. As opposed to, ah, it just all happens. Does that make sense? Um, Michael Terry wrote, uh, easy to ask for help. Tell me about that, Michael. What, what, what stood out in your mind when you're doing that? Um, well, I started, uh, when I was conversing with Chris, I decided, okay, well, I need an accountability partner. I need somebody to help me develop my strengths. And Chris accepted on that. So Chris and I are going to be reviewing scripts presentations, listings, but we're not going to do it on just a, um, a 20 minute segment. We're going to do it on uh, hopefully an hour segment. That way we both get to uh, accelerate what we're trying to do, which is get listings, find buyers and get past that rejection. And I want to get to the level of an Irene. You know, right. where it's just bang, 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 as opposed to second nature, make it first nature. From your lips to God's ears. Um, <laughs> <laughs> comes with a Philip, though, I got to warn you. Um, <laughs> I got the Philip. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, so that's great input, um, Michael, because it, you, you, does it take the pressure off you knowing that you don't need to be the smartest person in the room? I know I'm not the smartest person in the room. <laughs> right? I'm with you, brother. Um, I, I kind of feel like, you know, we say this about Keller Williams, right? That the company exists for the agents, so that it's a, it's a bottom up kind of thing. But sometimes um, the training, the coaching comes a bit top down. And I think it's in a situations like this where you can rely on the person beside you because they typically have all kinds of work experience, either in other fields that they did prior to real estate or if they're having success in real estate, they're, they're able to really contribute and help you mastermind. And I'd like you guys to consider that is, has anybody ever done Weight Watchers or maybe know someone who's done Weight Watchers or been a member of the running room or had that sort of accountability mastermind around something like that? Like that's why that works so well. I remember having a, a training group uh, and they would, like, I, I didn't really want to do a, like, who wants to run on a Sunday if the weather's like this? I mean, for two hours in the cold, um, you know, when I was doing triathlons, I'd swim first and then go for a run in the cold. Uh, if I wasn't meeting a group there, I probably don't do that if I'm just an individual. So achievement in some of these things is, it's not easy. And so rely on the support mechanisms that are around you. And Typically, Keller Williams agents are great support mechanisms, right? Because they tend to come with an abundance mindset and they, you know, they, they'll share their successes. What else did you guys uncover about someone else's ability to um, set a goal, identify strengths and weaknesses and overcome an obstacle? Or uh, what, what other takeaways did you have either directly or indirectly from the exercise? I'm just going to jump in real quick, Stephen. Uh, Nadia had, the, the, had a great line. She said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Mm, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Sorry about yeah, that. Because then it becomes was... ego over learning. I, I found in our, our breakout group, you know, when you look at obstacles and what's standing in the way, it was very consistent of um, for the three of us because a lot of times it's, you know, obstacles are sometimes excuses or it's the fear of wanting to achieve your goal or wanting to put the work in. And it seemed that we were all... It's, it's a very, not a common theme, but, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to, at the root of everything is, is, is fear. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And often uh, we don't see ourselves in the light that we are actually in. And it's sometimes people's faith in us that we can do it. That makes us take the first step. Often we're progressing towards our goals 
in the dark going up a long staircase and having an accountability partner is just having someone there to turn on the light. And you go, oh, this is where I'm going. And then it just takes place. I, I couldn't understand when I was doing my first marathon, I was doing some training and these experienced guys that had done like Boston, all these like X amount of times. And they had me doing this training run. And it was like about six weeks out from the race. And it was a 30 kilometer run that day. And I thought if my goal is to break 320 and I'm taking three hours and five, seven minutes to do 30 kilometers, how am I going to squeeze in the remaining 12 K <laughs> in 10 minutes? Like, unless I hop on the bus, like a ain't happening. And what I didn't understand is I didn't know how to trust the process. I didn't understand that the training program was supposed to be, get me ready for the day. I wasn't supposed to be ready before. How can you be ready for before? If I was ready before, I wouldn't need to do the training. So sometimes we just need to commit to the activities. And it could be things like script practice, boring. Okay, but... You know, do you think it's really exciting to go for long runs? I mean, it was great for lead gen for me. Hey, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I do Ford with them for like, and then just run with somebody else, right? And, you know, they couldn't get away. It was like a two hour run. <laughs> so you really find out a lot where people were at. And a lot of times if you're out running, you'd be going by for sales signs. You know, oh yeah, that was at 875 and this is 1.2. And oh, I sold that one there. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it was great. I got so many leads. People knew I was a realtor. I didn't have to wear my pager or anything back in the day. Um, but it was just good for conversation, right? So use your peer group in the office or use a peer group even outside of the office. Because sometimes they bring innovative, new, fresh ideas to the table. If there's one thing you could do to commit to self-mastery, it would be lead a mastermind with two or three or four individuals that want to meet monthly around committing to a goal. Now, they could be different goals for each one of you. Someone want to work on their listing presentation and master it. And somebody might want to work on their buyer presentation. And somebody may want to work on their conversion from agent locator or Facebook leads. Whatever that's going to be. And they're going to identify the steps that they need to take to do that. And then they, you know, just hold each other accountable on that and then brainstorm. Because there's a lot of parallels between building a buyer and a listing presentation. There's a lot of parallels between converting online people as much as there are inline people. It's just subtleties in how you apply it. Fair. Any closing thoughts before we move on to our next chapter? It just let you know, too, we're on pace. We'll be done by about 6.30, so we're doing good. Um, don't worry, the other five perspectives are all easy. Uh, all right, let's jump ahead in the PowerPoint here. Uh, before we do that, are you committed to an action step? And if so, write it down right now. Commit it in writing. So if it goes from your brain through your lips to the pencil tip, there's a much better opportunity that you'll follow through. I see Michael's writing. Heidi's writing. Some of you are pretending to write now. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. This is just to get you thinking. The good thing about having the manual as a PDF is it's something you could review. And you might, you know, before doing, um, are there any stats on writing versus typing? I'm sure you can find them, uh, Billy, if you Google it. Uh, I don't have any that I use as a resource, but there's a huge, I I've seen it so many times in training materials that um, uh, when you're writing, um, it, it's, a, it's more intuitive. It slows you down to write out the words. And for some people, they need to slow down. And other people love to type and they'll do it on their phone because it's just their... I'm, I'm a writer. When I read a book, I typically journal beside it. That's how I retain stuff. Everybody's got a different learning. So I think just find yours would be my advice. All right. 80-20 uh, principle. So in the manual, um, there's a page 
Um, it's, it's got a picture of the millionaire real estate investor. It says more results, fewer activities. Uh, in, in, in case some of you haven't downloaded the PDF and you don't have it in front of you, I will quickly read through it. Um, apologies if the voice gets monotonous. I just want to get through this story. And I would like you to identify words or sentences that resonate with you. And then let me know your thoughts um, once we go through it. In the 1940s, quality control manor, manager, Dr. Joseph Duran, documented a life-changing universal, universal principle that he called the vital few and the trivial many. The idea was that a relatively small percentage of your efforts lead to the vast majority of your results. He attributed some of his findings to the statistical work of an Italian economist, Vilfredo Pareto, who had observed that 80% of the wealth in his country was owned by 20% of the population. As fate would have it, that broadly embraced principle came to be known as Juran's Law, but as it wasn't known as Juran's Law, it was known as Pareto's Principle. These days, we simply call it the 80-20 principle. And the idea is that 20% of your actions lead to 80% of your results may be the one of the most powerful principles you can apply to your life. It's about getting the most from your time and effort. It's about maximizing your results. It's about having focus. Focus is the key to great success more than effort, experience, or even natural ability. Let me reread that part. Focus is the key to great success more than effort, experience, or even natural ability. Look at the highest achiever in any field and you'll discover that they have a one, uh, have powerful focus. Just as importantly, you'll learn that they focus on the right things, the handful of truly important issues that make the biggest difference. Thoughts? I can chime in there for, for a moment. It, it's but this that... is the last time, Irene. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's, it's really, it's important uh, that that last piece, focusing on the right things. Focus is critical, obviously, but it is focusing on the right things because not everything matters equally, as we know. And uh, what you focus on expands and you need to, and, you know, again, goes back to the priorities, figuring that out so that you can make sure that you are focusing on the right things. Yeah. Who else took something out of that? Who else kind of hung on a word like vital few and trivial many? Focus and will. Okay. And any reason why that maybe resonated with you? Uh, getting back to Irene's point, uh, focusing on the right things and having the will to follow through. Okay. Love that. Who else? Anything stand out in that 80-20 principle? Well, let me put it another way. What did we talk about at the beginning of the session? That mindset was key, right? It's the key. You can have the car, but unless you put the right gas in it, it ain't, it ain't going to function properly. So you could have a great business plan, a good office to go do to do it in. But if you show up and you're just not in a mindset to get it done, you're cooked, right? You put in an average day. Whereas when your mindset's totally where you need it to be, can you walk in and it's four o'clock? You mean, man, that was a productive day. Now, lately, that commute's been like a three-step walk to the other end of the table where your power cable is because you're working from home. But I want you to think about it back in the old days when you go to an office. Like, how important is it to guard your mindset? So let me ask you, before you start your day, what does your routine look like? What are you purposefully doing to guard your mindset? Is I would view my, my GPS and my 411. Okay. What if I don't have a GPS and a 411? How can I protect my mindset before going into the office? I meditate. I love that. Tell me about that experience and what does that do for you? Well, it puts me in a very positive framework. I only do it for about 20 minutes. First thing when I wake up, I'm not even out of bed. So I'm already, you know, in that sleepy state where it sort of sticks with you and it changes everything. 
makes you want to get up. You feel great about the day. Uh, you're positive because in the world we live in, it's easy to get, you know, negative real quick. And I just find, um, I don't know, it just gives you, you know, a, a more purposeful meaning to your day, or at least you feel that you have a more people purposeful meaning to your day, whatever that is. Love that. Love that. Um, thank you. That was Kathy, right? Yes. It was Kathy. Yeah, it was Kathy. Thank yeah, we've got um, exercise and no tech from Roy. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. So what I started a couple of years back is I just started a five minute journal. And I thought anything I could do that, that would take five minutes, it would have a big impact. I'm all into because typically I've done it the other way where I do a lot of time for a little impact and that's not very rewarding, right? I just started journaling and I just asked myself three questions when I got up in the morning. What am I grateful for? And sometimes they were very simple things. Like I'm grateful for my, um, I'm grateful for my espresso machine. So I love my coffee in the morning. Grateful that my dog just always seems happy in the morning when she gets up. 17 second journal before I get out of bed. Wow. I've, I've, been, doing, I've been doing that for about uh, probably 15 years. So the first, the, first, the first thing I do is I get, I have a pad beside my bed. I get up. I, I don't even get out of bed. I just write, I write for 17 seconds. A lot wow. of it's, a lot of it's gibberish. A lot of it's meaningful, but it just, um, it's kind of drink. It's a kind of like drinking that glass of uh, water and lemon, kind of just just boosts your day. Well, Roy's going to continue teaching the class because I've been leading you down the garden path towards a five minute journal. He's got a seventeen second journal. Seventeen that seconds. That is impressive. Seventeen seconds. I don't even get out of bed. That is good. That is quick. When are you getting published? <laughs> Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> Help <me> soon. <laughs> but. Uh, so my point is I write down three things I'm grateful for. I write down three things that need to happen today to make today awesome. I'll give you an example. I might write, um, just gotta, I wanna make my connects today. I wanna make them early and get them done. And I don't call it lead gen. I just say, make, it my, make my connects. The other thing I wanna do is I wanna get something healthy and nutritious that I've made at home into my body around 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And the third thing might be, um, it could be something as simple as reach out to someone in my market center that I haven't spoken to in a while and find out how I can be a difference maker for them. And then I'll write one affirmation. Today I'm inching closer to a better version of myself. Today I will lead with intention on what matters most. Today, the hair product I have won't make my hair look gray. Whatever, I, I, I try. <laughs> this is a COVID thing, it's not really. Anyways, my idea is that I complete that and then just before I go to bed at night, I grab that five minute journal again and I don't know, maybe Roy, you got a 17 second finale at the end of the day. I'm a five minute guy. <laughs> and I just write out um, three things that happened today that um, made the day great. And now the last part, it's not a regret thing. So I don't want you going to bed with a regret mentality. It's a, what is something that I could have done today differently or or what would i what could i have done in a in a different way or with a different result in mind and it might be you know i wish i would have called five people today and found out how i can make a difference for them i think i've got time to do that because it gave me great energy it could be something like that it could be i'm going to end every day with calling one of my happy clients one of my happy agents i'm going to call one of my cappers who just capped. How's it going being on 100%? Love it. How long are you on 100% for? 11 and a half months. Damn. <laughs> as the team leader, I was like, wish we could stretch that out a little longer. But that, that's the magic of our comp plan, right? Yeah, good point, Donna. The one thing 
Uh, great book. It's just a great read and it covers a lot of this. A One Thing Workshop, January 26th with James Shaw coming up. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. They also have a couples retreat that uh, Wendy and Jay host. Because sometimes it's it's like things in your work world are, are good and they're progressing, but your biggest improvement will come from an alignment with your partner. And so sometimes doing a couples retreat, retreat gets you engaged. And when things happen on that level, yeah, the one thing planner, when things happen on that level, it can it can just create so much more momentum and energy when you're in alignment. <clears throat> So 80-20 principle, does this group have questions about the 80-20 principle? I get a sense because of who's on the call that you guys have kind of got this locked down. Mm. Questions about how you really make that work. We've under- Stephen, uh, maybe, sorry, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm here still. Um, you know, sometimes uh, when I speak with a lot of people, they, they find it harder to figure out what their 20% is. What is the 20% that they should be focusing on? So what would your suggestions be for that? Well, here's the thing, right? Um, you want to look and calendar your day and identify it with, in my world, I identify it with colors, right? And I know in my, my calendar, if I don't see enough blue... I'm not talking to enough people outside of KW. I'm not sharing our success story and finding who might benefit from that. If I don't have enough red, I'm not meeting enough organizationally with the people in my world that are going to drive our business. If I don't have enough uh, green, I'm not spending enough time with my existing agents. And I look to try and keep that balanced. So it's not, you know, the one thing gets confusing because sometimes we identify it's not the only thing. It's what is your one thing? So if you look at your growth plan and you identify what are the things that matter most? Well, I work with so many buyers because I just don't have a good listing presentation. I don't lead gen a lot because I'm not really that great with listing presentations. Patients. I got integrity and work ethic and market knowledge, and I am great with buyers, but there's an eight to one ratio on time to energy with a, a seller. But if I don't have the skills, I don't do the work. And if I don't do the work, I don't get the result. And so I tend to bring a dialogue about that always brings buyers into my world. So if I want to affect a change and become a listing agent, I need to become the economist of choice. I need to be someone who talks about the trends. I need to identify what are the things in my social media that would drive more listing inquiries as opposed to buyer inquiries. What is it in my email signature? What is it? What can I do? So my theme could be this year, part of my 20% is changing the messaging going out to friends, relatives, consumers in the world that says, I'll work really hard and show you lots of houses. As opposed to a message that might be, you're a consultant. They seem to know, they seem to have a way. They're the person that's going to uh, enhance the value of my property. And, and, and they're, they're not looking for the work ethic thing as much. It's just assumed it's there. So sometimes you might want to identify that if I go about my business the same way, all I've really got to do is change my messaging and how I talk to people. Like a new agent will often be working with a lot of leases and they might be very lucrative leases and they're quick and they're in and they're out. It's a like cash money, but they're losing the opportunity. So I would flip the script on that activity. And instead of telling people or not telling anybody that I'm out with a tenant, because who wants more rental referrals? But I would just spread the message that I am doing that. I tell them, tell the world about where the market's at vis-a-vis -vis that and find out who else would like to have someone pay down their mortgage, have someone pay down their mortgage for them. Or who else would like to have a surefire way of getting AAA tenants. That's going to speak to landlords and investors 
and people that may want to dump some of their inventory and they're ready to cash out or people who want to invest. So now you're going to use a story. And, and, and so your 20% could be really finding out what is the messaging I'm giving out to the world? God help you if the messaging you give out to the world is that you're overwhelmed and you're busy. Nothing says don't send me any more business than I'm really busy. I'm busy. I'm overwhelmed. Oh, so busy. Are you busy? I'm busy. Right? How are you? Great. How are you doing? What can I help you with? It's a much better lead in than I'm busy. So like you see how those subtle changes and that could be coming from your journaling and your script practicing. Like you might say, well, what changed this year? Well, I, you know, I invested 30 minutes three times a week in script practice as opposed to practicing on my clients. I started working with colleagues and I up my game and I change my dialogue and I say, um, less. And I say, you know, typically, because typically I say typically like all the time, typically it's in every sentence. And I've just learned to change my language and all of a sudden your game ups. Are these some examples, guys? Takeaways, ahas on that? Did that address a bit of your question, Irene? Oh, kind of says it there, right? What's the vital few? Like, are you a wandering generality or are you a meaningful specific? Oh, I like that. Right? Wandering generality or meaningful specific. It's not the job for other people to know what your purpose is. You need to know what it is and you need to state it and go after it. Thoughts? I love that. I love that last part. It's not everyone's job to figure out what your purpose is. Thank you. I, I really still... like that. <clears throat> So the reason why it's counterintuitive is we feel like when we build a to-do list, that if we can just get everything done, everything will be fine. And we know that's a fallacy because anytime you go on a holiday, not everything got done. And when you got back, that stuff was still there and, and you had a great time away. It's the same thing in your job. Your job as a realtor and your business as a realtor, not everything needs to get done. Not everything matters equally, right? Um, when you've got a sensitive case in a hospital and, and a person's just, they just need the right bedside manner, it's critical, right? But if I've been in a horrific accident and I'm bleeding, the bedside manner is not important. Like stop the bleeding. So in your case, you got to identify what, what's the most urgent thing? And if you can line that up with the next most important thing and the next most important thing, it all comes together. So I've been asked and tasked with the idea of growing a market center. And I identified a few things and a few things only that had to exist for our market center to thrive. And we've grown from 84 agents to just shy of 350 in five and a half years. How did we do that? <laughs> what's that i said that's amazing yeah well just overnight you know just overnight it's easy yeah. now no work no work involved <laughs> in that. Is, we, said, we just said nobody gets in front of the room that isn't valid in what they're training or teaching we're gonna really drive productivity through listings and we're gonna find people who are learning based and want to be coachable to what best practices are. So we weren't gonna try and convince anybody of those things. We just wanted to look for people who saw that. And we just went to work. You just don't have a big result with a complicated set of criteria. You just need to really refine it and go small and then the dominoes line up. Fair enough? If you're going to take the time to read the one thing or, or listen to their podcast, they've got a great podcast. They'll walk you through things like make a success list, not a to-do list. 
which is just Pareto principle. You might have 25 things you got to get done by the end of the weekend. But if you narrow it down to the top five or the very one thing that's most important to do, that'll drive your success. For those of you that need to rush home every day and make sure uh, dinner's cooked for the kids, you guys would recognize that if you had to list the priorities, the most important thing is that you're there to share the meal with them, right? Who tidies up after and who did the meal prep is, while important, it's not as important on whether you're there or not. And what I mean by that is, is your phone off and are you fully present during that meal time? Are you really fully engaged in them as your mind okay. elsewhere? So I'm not even talking about like, are you sitting at the table, but is your spirit at the table? And I, you know, that's like, if you could just do that, anybody's like feeling they've got connection with their family, it probably would come down to, did you have your meals together at dinner Monday through Friday? And was there a, a, a sort of aura around that table where we were all engaged with each other? Just an idea, right? Like that's a simple way of doing it. I mean, when we took it to the work side of things, we say, well, listen, if you're doing your lead generation, you're making your contacts, can you have any distractions? Can Facebook be on? Can this be on? Can that be on? Right? It's amazing to me. Sometimes I'm doing a training session with somebody and I look back later and they were like posting on social media while the training session was going on. <laughs> right? It's like, that wasn't a commitment to themselves. It doesn't matter to, to the instructor. I'm saying like they weren't committed to the learning process. So ask yourself, are you doing those little things that are most critical? Um, I remember going to uh, a training session one time and it was a military fellow and he basically jumped out of planes for a living. And uh, he said, uh, the one thing they taught him is to always make his bed first thing in the morning. And he kind of questioned it, right? He goes, all the technical things we need to do to be a professional military personnel person, like why is making my bed so critical? The corners all. And they basically trained it into him. They said, basically, it doesn't matter how lousy your day ends up. When you get back to your bunk, if you're dead, your bed's all fresh and looking sharp. At least you can relax. <laughs> There'd be nothing I worse than that. that terrible day of being in the army and find your bed's a mess. <clears throat> right so there's examples of one thing extreme Pareto is just basically drilling it down to that one thing and it could be one thing in your job one thing in your business one thing in your health one thing in your finances one thing in your relationships and you can put those into a 411 a tool we'll talk about in a little bit so that you're not focusing on many things in one dimension you're on a few things because it's just one thing in this, one thing in this, one thing in this, right? Uh, oh, we're at the 411. So other than Irene and maybe Janice, who here has had a strong relationship with the 411? I'm not looking at the chat box right now for some reason, but oh yeah, I am. Um, anybody want to unmute and share any of their success with the 411? Who's confused about the 411? Who knows what a 411 is? <laughs> yeah, does anybody like, uh-oh, uh-oh. This is exciting. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so if you turn to page 37 in the manual, take a moment to go to page 37. And they've got this drawn up for an agent. Now, I teach a course called QL. It's, it's short form for Quantum Leap, and it's a co course that's directed to 18 to 28-year-olds. And we get them using 411s, and it's like the clouds parted and the light shines, and they get clarity on their day. It's what millionaires use but we can't get real estate agents to take a business plan and just kind of revise it to a one day, one pager that they, they could just own. 
if there's one thing that's given me success in the leadership role in the market center is the one key person that reports into me that's the most critical, my market center administrator. She does a 411 with me every week. And the best thing I can do as a leader is identify what I can do to support her to hit those goals. In most cases, when you've got talent working with you, you're going to actually take things off their 411 to simplify it because they tend to take on more than they need to. And they work too hard and they work too much. We're simplifying things and getting her focused and really going super Pareto to get just a few things done. And, and because the priorities are done, everything else falls into place. When you do that, other people in your organization get to shine as well. Other people pull up the slack. So what I want you to think about is if you were going to do a mastermind and you were going to commit to doing something with someone that had any kind of follow-up, this tool would be it. Now, does anybody have page 37 in front of them? A few of you. So well, 411 is basically going to help you identify what are your annual goals. And we encourage you to have annual goals in your job, your business, your personal financial, and your personal. So in this example, it says, I want to get 24 listing, 18 buyer sales. Uh, sorry, 24 listings sold. I guess they're in a tough market. They need to get 60 listings to 24 listings to sell. <laughs> We could get four listings and sell it 26 times. <laughs> <laughs> Inverted. <laughs> funny, not funny. Not uh, funny. <laughs> you know, especially if you work with a buyer. Um, and they need to go on 150 listing appointments. So they're in Iowa somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Have you gone on 150 listing appointments just yourself? It'd be funny. Um, how many cups of tea would that be? Uh, 76 buyers. So it just breaks it down, the job part, the business part on what they need to do in the course of a year. Now, this isn't a business planning session, but you could easily back out. Um, you can easily back out what your yearly goals are projected down to something as simple as how many appointments do I need to go on? How many people do I need to add into my database? By the end of the year to get my database to the right number of people that'll generate the right amount of referrals and leads for me. In the business part, that's the kind of like, how many of those people do I need to add? How many appointments need to go on? In the, um, sorry, in the job part, in the business part, it could be refining my listing presentation to have it fully digitized. And by the, um, by the end of Q1, I wanna be able to fully deliver that listing presentation online and get it get people to sign the listing agreement online without me ever going into the house. I would like to make it happen that way. Has anybody ever listed a property with someone they've never met and a house they've never seen? So it's possible. Not yet. Okay. It happens all the time. It's just, it's not the way we've been doing it. So we don't really know that other people are doing it a different way. And they are. And there's ways and things you can do to make it work. We just haven't explored them. So part of a mastermind group that would be digitizing my listing presentation might be in the first month would be, when you break it down to your month goal, it could be getting it all online. By the second month, it could be whether the ancillary things online in a Zoom conference that I would need to master. In the third month, it could be how do I gain engagement and what pre-work could be done by the seller to getting, get more engaged in the process. What could I do preemptively to develop more feedback from the seller? Getting them to send me pictures, getting them to do this, getting them to do that. What, what kind of things could I do? There's so much work that you could do before getting a listing. Kate Peterson taught me that when she walks into a listing in her farm area where she's known and they know she's effective and they've been on her website and they've already kind of talk price already. The first thing she does when she sits down, she looks him in the eye with a big Kate Peterson smile, like this, shakes her head. Before we complete the paperwork, do you have any other questions? 
<laughs> and about 15, 18% of the time, they go, no, let's just get the paperwork done. She goes, man, I had a whole hour and a half to talk. Saved. So she goes home and she talks to Jeff for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my point is we just don't, we'd never think to ask that. It was too forward. Or, no, no, it's probably because we haven't done the right preparatory work for that to be natural. That's all. It's not impossible. It's not wrong. It's not that it can't be done here. It's that someone hasn't decided how they would make it happen here. Does that make sense? So when you break down your annual and your monthly, sometimes the numbers break down. Like if you want to go on three listing appointments a month because your goal is to go on 36 appointments a year. Or if it's four a month, then it's going to be one per week. It doesn't always divide up equally. So you might want to say, like Janice, if your goal was to um, have two people join the office that were cappers per month, would it be great to have three of those appointments booked by the 15th of every month? Like not, and, and then you're going to do a lot of your training and your coaching and your team, uh, your office meetings and your ALC meetings, like in the third week of the month, because you've got your appointments all out of the way. Right? Like what if we, we divided it that way? And then when someone's reviewing your, your 411, they can look at it and go, okay, I'm not going to talk to Janice about this stuff till next week, because I know she's focusing on getting these appointments in. Right? And if you can prioritize in your week what your job is, what your business is, what are you going to do financially with a paycheck that's coming in? And what are you doing personally around your health, your fitness? You just put those in. This isn't a to-do list. These are the big rocks. Stephen, can I, can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, please. So, sorry, it's David Capelli. Hey, David. Um, hey. Uh, I was, I don't remember if it was at a, one of the breakout sessions at, at family reunion last year, or if it was a Jeff Woods one thing session, I, I'm not, I'm, but yeah. I remember someone specifically saying they went from a 411 to a 111. Okay. And what they did was they worked the week uh, of six to 10 items that they wanted to put, send six to 10 items of rocks they wanted to put in the water. And then whatever wasn't accomplished fell to the back of the page for the following week. Right. And they prioritize. And then at the end of the month, if the things on the back of the paper weren't ticked off, then they weren't important. It didn't fall into their 20. Just wonder, I mean, from if you're, if you're going to start working with a 411 now, is that something you'd encourage or would you go with the 411 the way it was originally built and streamline it as you go along? I think taking action and then evaluating mm -hmm. as you go what's working is always the best plan. We're, perfection is highly overrated. I'd rather coach somebody out of uh, average way <laughs> than totally introduce something new. But I don't think you can be so out of alignment that you're going to run into trouble doing it the way you just discussed. Right? So no, I, I think that's brilliant. I think you and Roy are going to teach this course next month at my market center. <laughs> He's going to do the 17 second journal and you're going to do the one, one, one. No, I love that. Any thoughts on David's uh, suggestion? We all know Roy's brilliant, but what, what about David? I just love the focus that brings. Whoop. Yeah. Like we all so know, small. we all know what the year goals are usually, right? They're, they're not like secret. It's the mechanism that week, what's going to effectively get you that this week. Right. Well, the, the other thing that I found that it did was it it didn't give you an opportunity to to kind of skirt the issue or, or adjust for four weeks. It was very focus driven for a particular time frame. And you had to you had to you had to identify what was really you could accomplish in that time frame and yeah. how it impacted the month. Yeah, Let me, I love that, David. Let me give you another example. I had one of our agents here. So she had team members and it was like lead gen from nine to 11, Monday through Friday. And they weren't really getting to it. She says, okay, nine to 11 on Monday, you're going to follow up with all your weekend leads from open houses and inquiries. On Tuesdays, 
you're going to call past mm -hmm. clients on Wednesdays, you're doing social media on Thursdays, you're going to circle prospect at doors around the open houses you're going to host on the weekend. And on Friday, you're going to, there was another form of lead gen. So instead of trying to do a call in your database and then a couple calls around an area and, and you got to go look at where the phone numbers are and, oh, and you're going to go door knock. And it was like just breaking it down one day at a time in each segment of all the lead gen components. And that went super focused. So their two hours of time was really hyper-focused. The other thing is if you've got clients that you know you want to call, it'd be great if the day before you just throw the, the 15 names or the 10 names or the five names right in your, in your calendar. The agents that I need to reach out to and follow up with, they go right into my calendar. It says lead gen, but then it says Betty, 416, Barry, 905, right? And I, I, it's like, oh, yeah, call them. There's no looking around and don't go log into command and get sidetracked with some new feature. Oh, look, there's an event tomorrow. And oh, boop, just right into lead gen. Yeah, Michael, you've been, you've been on KW Connect, eh? <laughs> it's like being in Call of Duty for three days. <laughs> it's Friday already. <laughs> um, thoughts on 411, guys? Like, if you're not using an accountability tool that millionaires use, what are you using? The half a million dollar earner one? The $200,000 producer one? Like if you wanna try the 411, go to KW Connect and just search 411 and you could teach time management, the 411 in the market center, or you could do it as a mastermind topic. And I tell you, you will get good at just getting comfortable with doing that. Change is not difficult. Resistance to change is what causes problems. I like that. Just do it. Janice had a, a good suggestion, and I'm going to think about it for, for an upcoming calendar, is just actually doing a session on 411. Yeah. Yeah. Just, right? just, just help people understand how to prioritize. Yeah. One of the things you might do uh, as well, Irene, is ask your education chair or anybody in your education committee to reach out to Roland in Vancouver, the OP there, and they do a Monday mastermind at 9 a.m. their time. Oh, okay, that's noon our time. Or it might be noon, which is three our time, one of the two. And they're okay if you want to sit in as a fly in the wall and maybe you oh, cool. have a weekly 411 mastermind. And well, that's very, very cool because I am the education chair and we are building our community committees. So that's perfect. Yeah, so reach out to Roland. Tell him I sent you. Uh, all right, let's move ahead. So guys, I don't want to, I don't want to make this a 411 class, but I, I like I'm using it. I've seen the results. I know what my world was like when I didn't use it. It gives me clarity. Um, it allows me to understand, especially if you're building any kind of business, doing a 411 will mean you never do a performance review with somebody. There's nowhere to hide in a 411 and there's no emotion. Please reach out for me for any questions. Yeah, man, Janice can sit down with you guys and do a 411 really quick and walk you through those steps. The team leader role, if there's one thing we're held accountable to is like, what's our time spent on, right? And the 411 is, it's freeing. Um, okay, we're done with 80-20. Other than time blocking, is that a foreign concept to anybody or does everybody get time blocking? Here's my basic suggestion for time blocking. Put it in your calendar, just do it. Like I called Irene today and she said, in the middle of lead gen, call you later. I texted her earlier, I'm doing script practice. Like, like her world was going to come undone because I had questions about today's session. And you know what? That's why she picked me because she, I'll figure it out. Got in touch with Andy. All good. And there was no issues. But you know what? We, 
we like we like hanging out. We talk. We could probably kill 20 minutes in the middle of lead gen and feel really good. But that's not really her bigger purpose, right? So like you're, you know, Irene in the market center and Philip in the market center, Janice in the market center that I know and I get to interact with, I can tell they're using these tools. Your guys are recording this? Oh no. Yikes. So just protect your time block, okay? Um, when I first got here, they didn't know what lead gen was. They practice lead receiving and the average income is about 36 grand a year. Um, we barely could make our annual KW contribution, our KW CARES contribution international. We had to like go around and empty our pockets to have enough to give to international. And I thought, oh my God, they got to see someone lead genning every day. So I purposely left the door open in my office and I bought a headset. And so I'd walk around with the headset, no matter where I was going in the market center. And if anybody tried to interrupt me during lead gen time with a, have, have you got a minute? Uh, with usually really silly questions. Um, these were non-producers trying to be producers. They didn't, it was, it was crazy. I just wore a headset all the time. I just said, and they go, oh, you're on the phone. And every time they go by my office, I was on the phone and I was talking to people. And every time they go by my office, there was somebody sitting in my chair. Or I was trying to find somebody to sit in the chair. Because I thought, man, if I don't start bringing new people in here, these dogs won't hunt. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I had to find new energy and recore the market center and um, some very nice people, but they didn't need to be real estate agents. There's only like 16 agents left from the 84 that were here when I first got here, right? And some of them have gone on to do other good things in their life, but it, it wasn't going to be real estate. So it's the same thing. If you're spending too much time talking to the wrong people, like Irene, do you have an agent? She's not going to buy a house through me. Like if it's lead gen time, talk to people who don't have agents, oh, right? <laughs> right? Don't yeah. talk to people who already have a license. They ain't going to help you. Okay. That's it for time blocking. Um, build a bunker store for provisions. I think we've gotten good at that. We've probably had to do that a lot more during COVID. Has anybody revisited something they're going to do that's going to reprioritize how they use their time? Has anybody committed to making a change or doing a different activity? interested and committed to doing a 411 with with uh, learning how to do that with Janice or maybe partnering up with somebody and doing your 411s every week. Okay, Michael, if we met next week and we, you're going to do our 411s together, here's how you do it. So Michael, what was your goals? Uh, what were your goals last week? Okay, thank you. Uh, how did you do? Cross off the activities that weren't accomplished and move the other ones forward to next week. How do you feel about that, Michael? Hey, Michael, based on how you did, what is your new goal and what do you need to do now? Is there anything that might keep you from meeting these new goals? Let's identify training solutions that will support these um, job goals. Is there anything I can do to support you? That's all a 411 is. That's it. Those are the questions. It's right in career visioning. Another course I teach that it's, it's right in there. How to review for one. Does anybody gonna feel bad? Am I going to start training Michael? Well, you know, Michael, no, I'm here to help him self discover. If I'm his accountability partner, I'm just going to ask him those questions. I'm sure there's a few people in the office that have taken career visioning find it. It's in, um, I think it's in success through others in the third manual. I forget which page is on. I just took a picture of it and put it on my phone and I remind myself to stay on topic, even though I've been doing 411s with my MCA and she's got it and the productivity coach has it. And we just keep it in between the lines and unemotional. 
There's enough emotion in real estate. Don't have it in your accountability. Cool. Closing thoughts on 80-20 and, and getting your 411 on. Who's confused by 411 or let down or feels like, oh, I've heard this before. And is there anything we can do to help coach you off the ledge? It's just a really great tool. And I love David's modification of it. I, I, I'm going to steal that, David. That's going to be mine now. Next time I talk about 411s. E to P is just moving from entrepreneurial to purposeful. Entrepreneurial is a natural state in how, um, you know, how we operate, how we do things. It's, it's what comes naturally to us. There's no effort. Like it, when I say effort, like it just, you just, you go at the pace and at the rhythm and in the way that feels natural to you. And anybody that's an achiever usually has success. But when they get to a ceiling of achievement, they usually have some resignation. They kind of um, get a little down and they, and they maybe move on to other greener pastures. And so what happens is they reapproach hitting their ceiling of achievement, again, using the same ideas or the same habits, and they don't really, um, they don't have a breakthrough. And it says on page 51 that, you know, to have a breakthrough, you need to focus, find strategic options, find models to follow, install systems, and bring in accountability. Like Rick Elias decided to become purposeful. He chose to be happy as opposed to being right. And he's probably brought up in a way that served him well, maybe in business, where he was right. His way of thinking was imposed and, and influenced on others. But what he realized is that same approach didn't work in his personal life. And he decided he was choosing to be happy as opposed to right. So he adopted a different style that probably wasn't natural to him. If you're doing what's coming, what comes naturally to you, it's typically because you're using an entrepreneurial style. It's killing me to read my notes that are in my PowerPoint here. It's all up on the side to cover off the things. I would just talk to you guys for three hours and it would be good, but you'd get a different presentation every time. I follow my notes because I am not a focused individual in that nature and but it allows me to be effective in my role right so where are you where are you doing things naturally that are only serving you to this level and they're going to need to become focused and use systems and models to get you to another point i never script practice for 20 years and i sell lots of real estate right remember at the start of the course i said if you're here and you want to stay here don't do anything. You're good. You probably stay there for a while. You're an achiever. The problem is, is if you want to have a breakthrough, um, you need to, yeah, I'll give you an example of purposefulness. Um, I decided to do an Ironman triathlon. So I figured a marathon wasn't enough. Let's do an Ironman. So it's a four kilometer ocean swim. It's a 180 kilometer bike ride. And then a full 42 kilometer, 26 mile marathon all in one day and no time to sit down for a meal, right? So I'm deciding that I'm going to do this. And I realized my coach said to me, he goes, um, are you a good runner? I go, yeah, I ran Boston Marathon. He goes, good, because <laughs> I don't have enough time to work on your swim. So what do you mean? It's not for another year. He goes, yeah, I don't have enough time. It's going to take a lot of time to make you good in the water. So let's double down on what you're good at, but let's teach you how to swim without losing any energy in the water. So it won't make you faster. Um, I did do some calls while I was on the run and on the bike. <laughs> How's the market? Oh, it's really going. <laughs> um, so the idea is I just focused on that one activity uh, of being smooth in the water. 
I tried to be uh, really quiet in my mechanics. It didn't make me a lot quicker, but I didn't lose extra calories. I didn't spend extra energy and leave it in the Gulf of Mexico. And when I got out of the water, I felt like, oh, I'm in good shape here. And that served me well by being really purposeful in the swim that slow was smooth and smooth was fast. And it just, it served my purpose. The other thing that the coach made me realize is it was okay. I designed a plan that even if I did only 80% of it, I would get to the finish line. But more importantly than getting to the finish line is I had to get to the starting line healthy. And most middle-aged men are not coachable. They won't get asked, stop and ask for directions. And they don't tend to take direction very well. Ladies, are you with me? Like you've been telling him that for years. He hears it from someone else and he does it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so my <laughs> point is I just got dialed into my coach because I realized I would be too competitive with myself. I would push myself too hard. And I would think that nothing exceeds like excess. And what he did is he dialed it back for me. And a lot of my training, I thought I was under training. And what it was is I was getting lots of recovery, lots of rest, and I was developing and I was growing. So my way of training, I would have got to the start line, like injured. He got me there relaxed, feeling comfortable, efficient in the water. And I had a great day on the course. It was 11 hours and 17 minutes. It was a fun day. <laughs> Right. But if I if I had an entrepreneurial style, I probably wouldn't have I, I, I probably would have got out of the water and got off my bike away halfway through the bike and said, I'm done. My back is seized up. There's no way I can do the run. I've watched so many people in a, my age group overtrain. I've watched agents decide that the way they're up their goal is to work more. So you did 500 last year, you want to do 750 this year. So you're going to have X amount more business. How many hours a week you're working now? How many efficiencies are you building in? Because you don't have more time, right? Like if you had more time, would you have used it this year <laughs> that you just went through? So the key is, what are you doing to be more efficient? Can you be efficient with the level of thinking that you've got now? Probably not. So you can wait for a dramatic event, like your plane crashing into the Hudson potentially, or you could set a goal that makes you uncomfortable. Ooh, I can't do that. Well, of course you can't. Not unless you change a few things. What do I have to do? And that's when you start getting purposeful. That's when you start to go, well, I, I could do that. I could do this, I could do that. And next thing you know, you are following a system. It feels unnatural because it's not natural. Now, what happens is when you have the breakthrough and achievement and you're achieving that higher level, that now becomes the new normal and you repeat that journey. So it's not a one and done. It's a cons consistent cycle of evolution and development. Thoughts on that? So here's your five steps. Again, thoughts, guys. For someone new to this thought process of purpleness, where can one begin to create this? Well, you focus, so you write down your goals. You've already done that, Roy. You want to publish and you want to be healthy, right? So you're going to publish a book on health. Because <laughs> that would be a lot easier than trying to do both things. Um, you're going to focus on the 20%. So something like even the idea of journaling right away when you get up in the morning, that's, that's great. Where else are you doing that? And I don't know what the technical things are to help a writer write more, but I bet you if you got together with other successful writers, they'd probably share best practices. And maybe you're already doing that. Maybe you just need somebody to hold you accountable on how to do that. Uh, can I do it differently? Can I do it in a way that I haven't done it before? I've always written things down. Maybe I should type them. I've always read books, but now I'm using Audible. I thought, you know what? I need to like really relax a little bit more. 
I'm going to walk the dog because she never says no to a dog in the morning, 40 minutes. That's it. So I figure if I can get in eight, nine, 10,000 steps before hopping in the car to go to the office after I've had a good breakfast and I put on a book during Audible, I get some reading in. It, it's good for my brain. I, I get some moments of clarity just from walking the dog because she never really starts up a conversation with me. She leaves me alone in my thoughts and she's just happy. She just wags her tail. Golden doodle. <laughs> right? Doesn't bark, just walks, smells, right? So it's a good routine for me. I wasn't doing that before. And I was constantly juggling. I want to get the dog out. I want to kind of relax a little bit more. Uh, my day's fairly um, uh, productive and active and I pour into other people. And so I needed time for me to build up my, myself and pour into me. And I didn't need a big physical workout in the morning. So I don't exercise every morning. So the walk thing worked out and using audible, I got the book in. And you know what? I heard other people were doing that. My MCA was doing that. I, oh, you, I read that book. Did you listen to it or read it? She goes, it's the same thing. Go ahead, quiz me. Right? So, um, and then I just put it in place. So it's in my calendar. My spouse, surely she knows that's what I'm doing in the morning. And God love her. Like I'm going out the door and she always has one of these green shakes ready for me to go. It's great. If you're going to do that every morning, the way I can support you is make sure you got some nutrition with you before you go. I have no idea what's in here, but um, my point is what's your routine? Follow some model then and put the systems in place. And um, the dog holds me accountable I mean, the look she'll give Shirley if I didn't give her a walk in the morning for some reason, Shirley knows right away. You didn't walk the dog, did you? That's all the accountability I need. There's no, well, there's a bit of emotion in that, but it's okay. I'm trying to relate it to something very simple. I'm trying to keep it simple because we get really carried away sometimes on complexity around some of these things. How would you move from E to P? How would you do something differently moving forward around your goals? Would it be committing to a monthly mastermind? Would it be doing a five minute journal every morning to, to, to guard your mindset, protect your head? Any thoughts guys? Someone's typing an email because they're not typing in the chat box. This is your time to shine and don't make Irene talk again. She's dying. I can't hey, have Steve. her. Hey, Stephen, it's Dave Capelli. Hey, Dave, thank you. No problem. Um, for the longest time, I've always found that just a small mastermind group, just where you've got to show up and you've got to be honest with yourself and, and be real with your numbers um, is, is just, that little bit of accountability refresher because you can wake up and you can say you're doing your lead gen and say you're working your SOI, but if you get to the end of the week and you've got to get to that meeting and, and you're holding yourself accountable, honestly, uh, you really have to look at how many meetings you've done, what you've done to grow your business and, and be honest with what you've put on the paper. Any feedback oh. for Dave on that? Someone have any insight on what Dave just shared? Jeff, James, Heidi. Anybody going to connect with Dave to find out more about how he does those mastermind groups? They're really critical. Pretty, yeah, I think that's pretty important for us, for sure. If you read the book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, uh, there's a whole part on masterminds and it really centered around the philosophy of bottom up and crowdsourcing from the intelligence of the group will always be stronger than whatever you singularly bring to the table or what you could get from one other guru. But the collective group usually has solutions, connections, options, ideas that will support you moving forward. So consider that. Good job, Dave. Thank you. 
All right, jumping ahead. Uh, let's do this. Let's all take a three minute break. You need to check a phone, a bio break, just anything. Let's just take three minutes and we're going to come back um, right at uh, 2.15 and we'll knock out the last two chapters. No, no problem. Easy peasy. Okay. Take two seconds. And learning based vigils and individuals made the decision to use effective learning as the foundational piece of their action plan to develop their life. What would be the opposite of that? If you're ignorance based, you just avoid coming up against uh, new ideas and new concepts and you keep using the same old, same old, right? So being learning based is a purposeful pursuit. It's a choice. And really it's what defines who comes to KW. I found that over the years, the people that tend to thrive in our environment tend to be people that are uh, willing to um, consider different thought, different perspective, um, look at it from a different angle. So let's jump in. Um, so the difference between knowing for doing sake and knowing for knowing sake is knowing for um, just the sake of knowing is just kind of this mindless pursuit, like, like as if you want to win the trivial pursuit game. Like I know these odd facts, but they're not really helping me with what I'm doing. Knowing for doing sake is if they're going to be applied and used. So that's why I like a lot, some of the exercises in here. And again, you can go through the manual when you have some time and really revisit things like putting your 411, your to-do list, changing it into a success list uh, and the strategies to identify how to you know, do self mastery and, and get on that path. Um, you, you have to determine like, what is the things I'm studying? Um, without um, like, Sometimes, let me explain it this way. Sometimes you've got bad habits in the unconscious competence level. And if you have to take yourself back to the consciousness, you have to make yourself aware in order for you to relearn the habits. So in the book, Talent is Overrated, and, and I'll, I've really enjoyed that read. Um, basically, the author argues that absolute mastery requires st staying put in the conscious competence level so that you can keep refining what you're doing and how you're doing it, right? So the best example of that is there's four levels. They've got unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and unconscious competence. Can you think of something that we do with unconscious competence, like driving a car? Have you ever gotten home and you're, you're like, Wow, how did I get here? I just had a really good conversation. You didn't do anything wrong, but you consciously copyright, consciously operated a fast moving vehicle through the streets of Toronto safely without really being glued 10 and two and eyes on the road. Think about it. I, I mean, I remember when the kids were little and the kids are in the back and there's lots of distractions and right. So they basically talk to us that, you know, conscious competence is the best state to be in. Because if you're conscious about what you're doing and you're doing it habitually, you tend to stay in that mode and you continue to evolve and grow. But the minute you become unconsciously competent, things can slip and you could become the worst driver on the road over time if you're not aware of your responsibilities on the road. So, you tend to not be in learn mode if you're unconsciously competent because you're not even thinking about it. Record yourself next time you do a presentation. It's easy now. If you're doing a Zoom presentation online, just record it. You'll listen back to it and you realize, man, there's, there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of struggle there. Oh, I did this well. This story works good. That's a story that really presents that idea well. I'm going to keep this in play. There's a conscious competence. But if you haven't listened to yourself do a presentation in five years, there's possibility that there's some stuff that's gotten into your game that you need to kind of root out. The same goes in your systems, how you take a listing, 
how you update a client, how you talk about pricing strategies. You know, the, the way we price properties 10 years ago isn't the same now. The way we go to market 10 years ago is different than it is now. You've got to be consciously competent in order for you to bring new ideas in. Fair? So high achievers reach their goals by making training, education, self-development, the foundational piece of their action plan. Um, I'll give you an example. Jay Papazan, who wrote The One Thing, he's one of the co-authors. He's co-authors of The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Um, he's, he's the driving force behind The One Thing and the podcast that's there. And his goal is to read about 50 business books a year. Now, I don't know if you're like me, if I could read 50 books here, I'd feel like I'm pretty on top of it, right? The dilemma for him is there's 13,000 business books published every year. And if he falls one or two books shy and only does 48, he still hasn't even really made a dent in the entirety of the business books that were published that year. So when you're learning based you got to decide what am I learning and is it going to help me master something that will help me reach my goals because you can spend a lot of time taking in information that won't help you or won't apply to you or you'll never get a chance to really use so be selective and be purposeful around your growth plan and your education plan and mix it up change authors listen to different trainers different speakers have a different voice um, that may be speaking to you that may draw out a different perspective than what you're engaged in. So there's a ton of resources that you have available to you. Obviously, there's all kinds of books. We've seen, you know, from one thing to millionaire real estate agent, the millionaire real estate investor, there's some great stuff in there. I, I realized because we had Dave Jenks do a presentation. He's one of the co-authors in the book, he says, you know, people would come to him all the time and ask him about how do you put together like a really good listing presentation? And how do you put together a really good buyer presentation? And I thought, those are legit questions. Wouldn't you guys agree? Did you guys know it's in page 95 in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent? How to do a listing presentation and what to put in your right buyer presentation. Now, some things might be a bit dated in there, but and that analyze buyers' wants and needs. Help them get a clear picture of an idea of, of their ideal home. Guide buyer to a loan officer and them pre-approved. Like if this is your, this is, it's right in the book. Um, there's all kinds of things. People were asking me the other day, well, how do I bonus my staff? We had a record breaking year and I'd like to have a bit of a profit share formula. And I said, well, that's right in page two something in here. And I should know it specifically, but um, I've got, I don't have my regular book here. It's all tabbed and written up, but it's, it's in here on how to do the profit share formula with your own staff on a team. There's all kinds of stuff in here. So often we don't really read it to the level we, we do, uh, do need to, 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 to get ahead of it. But I would say, read those materials. They're full of concrete systems and tools but you could take it to another level. There's all kinds of podcasts you can listen to. Uh, Gary Keller has a Think Like a CEO podcast. Um, there's a One Thing podcast um, that I listen to. Some great, great sessions on there. Uh, the other one that I have in here, the One Thing. Uh, uh, Wendy Papazan and a couple of the ladies that um, their names are, I'm drawing a blank right now. It's a powerful uh, women's um, business leader. These ladies do like hundreds of millions of dollars in volume. And they're all typically working moms and have all kinds of different responsibilities. And they really talk about how they pull it together. It's really an inspiring um, talk. Um, so there's a podcast you can download. In terms of uh, online materials, uh, one of the easiest things you can do is go to KW Connect. There's a plethora of training materials in KW Connect. Uh, you almost need someone, and, and Janice would be great, or Irene, to, to kind of walk you through what are the courses you need to take this year and knock out of the box so that you can um, master the things that you need to master. Is, is there a coach I need, right? Beyond these other books, 
Um, do I need a coach? Am I the only professional that doesn't use a coach, right? Most professional athletes, most performers, um, most high achievers have multiple coaches. Do I need to have um, a coach in, in a personal part of my life? Maybe I need a personal trainer first before I get a real estate coach. Maybe I need to, um, maybe I need to do a mastermind group or a, I need a, a group that allows me to do uh, meditation and yoga that allows me to get me in a really healthy state of mind to handle the pressures and stresses that come with being a real estate agent. Because all we use solve problems all day for people. The day there are no problems is the day we're out of work. Well, it's challenging to get up every day and go fix people's stuff, right? So I would suggest to you that, um, you know, find that, that thing that's going to help you commit to learning. And sometimes that's the biggest role of the coach. It's not actually to teach you anything. It's just to help you. It will teach you things, but they need to hold you accountable to keep you on your path. Because they're the ones that kind of keep an overview and a 360 degree view on your growth plan and can support you towards moving you to that. Has anybody had success with a coach that could share a little bit about what it's meant to them to have a coach? And it could be a coach in another area of their life. Someone's had a coach. I know Irene's been in coaching for years. And I know I Jen have, Roy just mentioned that he has a life coach, which is a great benefit. Absolutely. Awesome. awesome. Anyone I, else? Because sometimes the big, sometimes the biggest issues are, aren't work issues. They're personal issues that you, that are not enabling you to do the work or, you know, to, it's it just, sometimes it's just what's in here and it has nothing to do with real estate. Yeah, it, has sure. every, it has everything to do with, just your your whole state of being right who you are what you think you are what you maybe can't do what you want to do so yeah so i've been dealing with a life coach for many years now so yeah me greatly that's great yeah thanks for that roy thanks for putting that in the chat the podcast empire builders is that not an amazing podcast irene those women are they're truly incredible they're they're powerhouses is an understatement yeah, and and men are allowed on too right they are, yes. It's it's non-denominational. Non-denominational. <laughs> You're not checking for a chromosome. I wanted to be politically correct there. Okay, cool. Um, has anyone had any coaching in their lives, maybe pre-Keller Williams or pre-real estate? Do sports count? Yeah. What did your best coaches do for you, Dave? Uh, actually, it's a bit of both. I, I, I was coached through the years, and I coached uh, both my kids at a very high level of soccer for many years. And I've always found that the greatest results came from a method called guided discovery, where instead of just laying it on the table and mapping it out for someone, you kind of directed them or pointed their nose in the right direction and kind of let them figure it out. Right. That's... I mean, ultimately, that's what the best coaches do. And sometimes I'll get that feedback. Well, when they go, well, what does the coach do for you? And they're like, well, it's not that they so much told me to do anything. It's they kind of held me accountable to my own goals and helped me self-discover when I was winning or when I needed to, like, step up. And, and I usually applied that growth myself. It wasn't them. They, they finished the call. They were happy. They were happy before they got on the call or happy when they get off the call. Their goal is just to help me connect with where I want to go. So um, I had a maps coach for five years. Um, I'm going to do a different coaching program next week that I'm starting. And just to get a, just a fresh language into my head. And, and I'm really excited about that. But my maps coach, man, I can't tell you, Tim Bodwine has been great for me. Um, I've got a lot of my agents doing coaching right now. It's, it's a real gift. They're coming back to me with, here's an interesting thing. Two of them are taking transformational coaching. And I asked them both on a, on an office meeting to share what their experience is like in their coaches. And they shared. And I said, now, does everybody realize they have the same coach? 
it, they describe their coaching experiences differently. So that coach has got the ability to really draw out their experience. So it could be transformational coaching. My son, Jacob, um, in his journey through Quantum Leap, he's a 25-year-old. He's finishing up a master's at U Ottawa. So he's taken QL for young adults multiple times, taking it with Gary Keller. He's listened in when I've taught it. Um, and he applied because when you go through that journey, you're able to, if you write out a mission statement and a GPS, you can apply to get free maps coaching. Now, if you're an agent in our system, you can get like real estate coaching. And Jacob doesn't want to be a realtor. God forbid we have another realtor in the family. Um, he, um, he, he wants to follow his path. And so they were just coaching him around some stuff. Now it's really hard, right? When you're interested in the environment to make a difference, it's a little like throwing a pebble in the ocean. Like, does it really have, does it have any effect? So he was trying to get the ideas that are in his head into practical application to create change. And they helped him work through that with an action plan, totally engaged a whole bunch of people, hundreds and hundreds of people online, completing surveys, creating a forum, chat groups, had people trying different alternative uh, diets and, and sending in recipes. And, and boy, was it ever a cool thing. And it created a much bigger ripple effect than you otherwise would have imagined. And he had a MAPS coach this summer for 90 days. And she had a really big impact on him. So Huge opportunity if you're up for it. And, um, uh, you know, there's no, there's nothing in it for me. Like, I'm not saying go get maps because I get a check mark by my name or anything. I'm just saying if you don't have a coach, you're like a for sale by owner in your business. You're your coach. Here we are getting consumers to use us as their real estate coach in a sense. We all know what for sale by owners do. They leave a, lot of, leave a lot of money on the table typically. And if they do well, they do it by chance and by luck. It's usually not planned. So if you want a chance with your success, don't be a for sale by owner. Get yourself a coach. At the very least, get an accountability partner that can hold you moving forward. That's it. That's it for coaching. <laughs> Irene, you want to say something, don't you? No? Okay. I love my coach. I love my coach. I love okay. my coach. Well, and, and you know what, though? I, I think the, the, I didn't want to say anything until you asked me. You shouldn't ask me if I want to say something, because even if I didn't, I will. Um, I, I do want to put a caveat on, on this, though. Um, the, the coach matters. So yeah. It's not just coaching. It's making sure that it's somebody who will be beneficial to you and hold you accountable don't let doesn't let you uh skate through anything and somebody that you can really get along with and somebody who you believe in because otherwise it's just noise and you're not going to do what what they're going to help you try and help you do yeah so if you're not sure about that get back to irene or someone like janice or philip and they can really um help you through that journey um, one of the easiest things is to be in uh, bold three times a year because you got coaching three times a year online by doing bold. Um, you know, there's a, is it on Facebook, the shift pivot uh, site. I forget what the name is. It's on my favorite. So it just, it opens up and you spend the mornings on James Shaw. There's just so much training available. Some of it acts more like coaching than it does training. So there's other alternatives too, if you're not ready to fully commit. And removing, removing limiting beliefs. Okay, so um, really what limiting beliefs do is they just hold us back. They're beliefs, so they're real to us. Um, I kind of shared a limiting belief about um, when I was training for my marathon, um, and, and I, I thought, how can I actually do this? And I, and I needed to understand I needed to trust a training. Um, I had a limiting belief at first when I took over the team leader role. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that people were going to rely on me to help me build their real estate careers. And then Sonny sat down with me and he said, well, Stephen, like you've been an agent here for two and a half years. When you came to us, it was just you and Shirley, how many people on your, on your team now? Well, I said, there's, um, 
beyond Shirley and I, there's three salespeople and two admins. What's the GCI been like? Well, we've gone from 400 to uh, that year, we got to 940, just our third year into coming to Keller Williams. And um, who knew though, eh? They kicked me off the team in the team leader role and surely kept growing the business <laughs> without me. Apparently I was the anchor, not the sale. Um, but my point is, um, you know, I, I, I'd already started following the models that other agents would be able to use. And he says, how many people have you introduced to Keller Williams that have named you sponsor? I said, well, about 15. So well, how, how did you do that? I said, well, I introduced them to you, my team leader. He goes, no, but how did you get them to meet with me? I said, well, I just started talking with them about their life and their business and asked them how it was going and figured out what they were doing well at and maybe any gaps that they wanted to attack and, and, and what would happen if they didn't fix that. And if I could introduce them to somebody who could fix it, would they want to talk to that person? And he goes, that's, that's all you're doing as a team leader. You identify the gap between where people are at and where they want to go, what might be the issue, and you suggest ideas that will help tackle that problem. And you've already built a team. All you're going to do is just build a bigger team as a team leader. Can I do it, Sonny? And yeah. So he went and bought an office for me and said, go be the team leader. <laughs> And it, it just worked out, but I had a lot of limiting beliefs. And when I realized, and you know, sound corny, it's like a Disney film. It's like the magic was already inside me. Like I was already doing the team leader role. I just didn't know it. I was just being nice to people, helping them out with their business. That's what a team leader does. They should be happier about it. <laughs> Janice is a happy team leader. Some are grumpy. <laughs> I'm still laughing that you actually said the Disney line. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> My other favorite is uh, Shrek. Growth is good, donkey. Like, it's, it's all about growth, right? So your limiting beliefs are going to feel like quicksand holding you back. I'm, I'm too long in the business to learn new things. I'm too set in my ways. People won't allow someone else to show them the property but me. Like for the love of the God, hire a showing agent for some of you guys. Like someone else will have a GPS, a watch, a calendar, and know how to dress right and show up on time and say, this is the kitchen. Like you can give up a little bit of your money for a lot of your time. And that agent might use that over the next one or two years just as a stepping stone until they really evolve in their career. They don't need to join your team. They don't need to buy, find a showing agent. Some of them would love to shadow and learn the, the skill sets around that, right? So there's, there's a, oh, I can't really build a team, but you can get a showing agent. You can outsource a lot of the things to a virtual assistant. Oh, it's a big commitment to get an admin. Big commitment. Really? It's a bigger commitment to keep yourself as the admin. It's holding you back. Like you cannot up your dollar per hour if a good chunk of your day is spent doing $20 an hour stuff. It's impossible. There are only so many hours in the day. So you've got to identify your, your limiting beliefs. And ultimately what you're going to do is... Um, I want you to think back to a time. So instead of doing a breakout session, we're just gonna, just gonna walk you through this. Think of a time in your life when you had a limiting belief you needed to remove. How did you do it? What new successes came your way once you removed the limiting belief? So just think on that for a second. I'm not going to ask you to share. Don't share. Now, what you would normally do is you'd ask your partner what was holding them back. So this is a great mastermind session. If you guys want to do this, do a, a remove your limiting beliefs um, workshop. And all you're going to do is you're going to ask your partner what's holding them back. And then 
you're going to talk about collectively as a group in a safe space, what steps someone could take. Like someone said, maybe, maybe the life coach is helping them more than the business coach because they need to get some stuff settled at home or in their own personal headspace so that they can perform at a high level professionally. So however that looks. And basically in your mastermind, you just switch roles and you can troubleshoot that. I have a fear that I'm not doing it right. Well, great. Write out your business plan, have your team leader review it. And as long as it's in sync and everyone thinks that that's a really valid and a good possibility of success exists with that plan, then just co concentrate on executing on it. Just, you know, the time to plan is you do it and then it just stick with it. And you can evaluate and adjust as you go, but just a lot of time we spend time thinking about something. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. It's like, no, there's a time to think and there's a time to do. So usually it's just finding that limiting belief I just, I just didn't know how I was going to do um, like some of those Ironmans and triathlons. The first time I, I stood on the, on the beach in Guelph and I looked out at the buoy because it was the first triathlon I did it was a 1500 meter swim. And I was with the three guys. We we're doing a fundraiser for one of our, for our real estate colleagues that passed away. And we raised 15 grand in his name to put a permanent plaque on the wall at sick kids. We love this guy. And we're all sitting there pumping each other up, bunch of young guys like, yeah, yeah, we got this. And we're all looking out at the buoy. And then as it calmed down a little bit, we looked at each other and goes, is that really far? <laughs> but, you know, I realized some people started. I had a wetsuit. There was somebody there that would bail me out if I couldn't do it and uh, just went in. you got to get rid of your limiting beliefs. And I think it's, it's a tool in your 411 that can help you with that. Your 411 will be the heavy lifting to acquire the new skill sets that are missing, that keep, are keeping you from doing that. Can you think of a limiting belief that you have gotten over that now you're good with? Anybody ever had like a fear of heights, scared of dogs, didn't like realtors and now loves them? <laughs> How many of you were feel for, went fearful when you started your real estate career? How many of you didn't think you could get to the level you're at now? Like, Irene, if I told you when you first started, you would be where you're at today, be a little less apprehension when you started? Yeah, if I knew then what I know now. Like how well it was going to turn out. I right? almost quit my third year in the business. I was this close. Yeah, yeah. It was tough when we started, mm -hmm. right? Shirley went back. She waitressed for a while. She worked back in the fitness industry for a while. Said, you're crazy. You go live your dream. I'm going to go make some money. And I just stuck with it and stuck with it long enough that it worked, right? Um, but there's a lot of limiting beliefs over what we can do, right? Can I add something please, to that? Please do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... A lot of times when people went like on this topic of limiting beliefs, a lot of times we get stuck in our head. I know I do. And I've talked to a lot of agents and, and, and we've had similar experiences. Um, you know, it, my limiting belief comes from how am I going to do this? How am I going to execute? And if you just focus on, you know, what your goal is and then follow, you know, be coachable to what you were saying about, you know, having, the 411 and, and some other tools that we have to implement that plan, the how shows up. And so you almost don't have to worry about, you know, you don't have to worry about like, I can't do this because I don't know how to do it. Right. I, I love that Janice. I love that you shared that. Um, when the why is big enough, you know, when, when the wow is big enough, the how shows up. So hundred percent. Um, yeah. Next, sorry, someone else? Just echoing that. Oh, okay, awesome. All right, well, let's jump into the next chapter. Um, being accountable. So this graphic, uh, and I think on the next slide, they talk about it, right? So it's a little hard to read on there. Um, basically being a victim, 
you see what lines up on the left. They don't seek reality. They don't, they fight reality. They blame others. They have personal excuse, excuses. They wait and hope. Understand, they're not necessarily negative. They're just almost resigned to a certain energy. And uh, they're not realistic. And they do play the blame game. They look for reasons why other people make them feel a certain way. They come up with personal excuses. And the old, well, you know, if it's meant to be. And then when someone's accountable, they always want to seek reality, that get real. Like, why wouldn't every Monday I want to just get real with where I'm at? That seems natural to me. Right? Like, I would check my watch when it was running in Chicago because I just wanted to make sure it was on track. That's all. Can you imagine if I didn't check my watch the whole race? Do you think at some point I could have thought, man, I'm behind and sped up and then kind of wasted my, my, my pacing because I was worried I was behind? Or imagine if I thought I was so far behind that I wasn't going to make my goal and I started fear and doubt and worry. And what if I was ahead and I started to ease off a little bit because it hurt? And that's when I just needed to just suck it up buttercup and keep it going. Like I, I think that in your business world, doing a 411 is like checking your watch. Like the Apollo rocket that took off from Earth to go to the moon is off course for more, um, like it's something like 90, almost 99% of the time. It does so many course corrections, what makes it go the way it's going. But it's essentially, instead of us seeing this, it's actually doing that. But the adjustments are so small and they're so frequent that it goes in a straight line. So all being accountable does is it allows you have that check-in to assess Hey, how am I doing? Right? So if you can be accountable with your activities and your schedule, you're enhancing your ability of hitting your goals because you can recognize when things are getting away. And that allows you to acknowledge it, own it, right? Like my kind of funny way of dealing with, you know, my, my team and by putting a headset on so people just thought, oh, he's on the phone. I don't want to bother him. And I thought he was doing nothing. So I was going to give him some talk about something that wasn't all that critical. But since he's busy, it's not important. When we were restructuring here and moving stuff around in the office, I actually shared an office with the MCA. And she was kind of like, you had to go by my desk to get to her desk. And there were so many people that would come into her office to chat and go like this <laughs> and then leave, right? And she was being bothered a lot by the agents because she was like the den mother keeping it all together, right? And um, they just all of a sudden learned to l l view her time differently. And she started viewing her time differently. And we were, we were looking forward now as opposed to always looking left and right to see if everything was okay. <laughs> it wasn't okay. <laughs> if we got real. We realized, no, this isn't going to work. We've got to retool this if we want a really vibrant brokerage. So we own that result. And we found solutions. We found how to build it. And we just got on with the business of doing it. These are really simple formulas. And that's why people sort of, they maybe miss it. You know, the, the joke in here, there's a video. Uh, you're not a, you've got a problem with accepting accepting personal accountability. And the other stick man answers, yeah. And whose fault is that? Total victim language, right? If people want to spend time coming to your door, ask them, listen, if, if you've got a problem, I'd like to address it with you, but could you come back in 10 minutes and give me your two best solutions? They'll go out, they'll figure it out, they'll come back in, give them two solutions. Great. I think you're both good. Whatever one you want to do. Wow. Thanks. If you fix it for them, they're going to keep coming to your door. So you are the solution to teaching people how to treat you. 
right? Um, thoughts, concerns. Have you ever been in a world where you were working with somebody and they, they constantly use victim language or conversely hired someone or got into a relationship with somebody, person professionally, and man, it was like wind beneath your wings, right? They just get stuff done. The first MCA I've ever experienced when we launched our office in Port Credit, the sweetest girl came over as a deals person from uh, Remax and um, she wasn't used to the double entry system that we are blessed with at Keller Williams. She wasn't used to all the splits and caps and royalty and profit share and all the routines we've got and the structure. And I sit in near her office and I could just see she was like really petite. And it wasn't long before the paper stacks of deals in her office were taller than her. And as sweet as she was, she just she couldn't get real, get set, take action. Just wasn't working. She didn't have the skills. Probably was because they didn't hire right. And they didn't pick up on the victim language. They were, they were kind of distracted by how nice and pleasant she was. The next person that went in, and you know her, Irene Kelly, it, she just went in and went, <laughs> the paper was gone. It's like the office looked bigger. And uh, man, she owned it. She kicked butt. So it was like night and day. So sometimes you're the victim in your own story. Just look to be accountable. So one of the things about being accountable is you need to be accountable. Who are you accountable with? Are you seeking reality? Do you have somebody that can help you with that? There's just a formula to that. You know, if you go through an accountability session, it's probably going to point out what we learned in chapter one, which is what's my goal? How am I doing with that? How do I feel about that? What do we need to do to stay on track to get there? That's it. That's why we try not to change our goals. When we set our goals in place, we change our activities. Does that make sense? Because the goal is not the problem. It's the activities usually. If we just keep changing the goal all the time, it's like we don't, we don't change our habits and our activities. So when you look at um, the achievement thing, it's really more about an attitude. And I couldn't agree more with, with uh, Gina Rant in that. Uh, we've kind of done the accountability victim thing. And I think when you're accountable, you realize that you're not the uh, person in charge of everything. You get to pick your profits and the people that are going to influence you, but you need to pick them. And if you're still the lead idea person in your idea world, that could be tricky because there's probably some people that, as we talked about in chapter one, like if you're committed to self-mastery, how many things could you be committed to? And you probably only master maybe a couple of things in your life. A really talented person might get to three. So why not leverage other successful people in your business world, your physical world, your spiritual world, your financial, and have them help you reach that success? No one succeeds alone. Get the help that you need in these different areas. Because you're going to use a, a, a bottom-up approach. If you're using a top-down approach, you're, you're basically having a conversation and a meeting with yourself all the time. You want to crowdsource from the best sources, pick a profit, and then draw from it. Or pick a mastermind group or create an accountability group. Uh, have a relationship with a coach and, and draw that all up to you. And that's what's going to make a big difference. Who are you missing right now? If you had to identify in those boxes, are you missing somebody around your financial, your spiritual, your physical, or your business? Who's in charge of happy in your world? Can you appoint a happy person to be in charge of your happy? Just that friend that always books the right weekend getaway when we're allowed to again. Uh, unless you're finance minister, don't go away. <laughs> um, just, you know, if, 
if you can think about it in context like that, you stop making yourself the single point of failure in your wonderful life. No one gets to the end and says, I did it. It's all on me. I'm responsible for everything. <laughs> if they're saying it, they're saying it like that. They're a little bitter. Most people are most gracious that they've had a lot of influences, some positive influences. A lot of us are grateful to have one person. If you can have many in different areas that you've selected, what possibilities does that open up? <laughs> I love your glasses. <laughs> Roy, Roy's playing around with uh, with his background and his uh, <laughs> his stuff. <laughs> I love that, Roy. You're gonna kick us off with this finish, okay? So who are the people in your boxes? So last but not least, and this is how we're gonna wrap it up. The last blocks here are: is what is your goal? How did you do? How do you feel about that? Based on how you did, what is your goal, and what do you need to know? And then you break it down into two things. Is there anything that might keep you from doing that? Identify your obstacles. If you needed training or support to do this, what might it be? I can guarantee you with all the time Janice has put in and the team leader role, you can go to her and sit down and break down your business. She can figure out what training or support you're going to need. And she can support you to get that. It might be a paradigm shift on how you look at something. It could be a routine switch. It could be changing your physical structure and where you work. It could be any number of things. She'll figure it out. That's what she's trained to do. Aren't you, Janice? Yep, that's what we do. We just help people figure that out. We're that accountability partner until they find maybe a group within the office or, or some sort of group. Don't be scared to mastermind with other Keller agents in other cities because they may refer you somebody from Vancouver or St. John's or Halifax. You can create those kind of masterminds as well. Um, I think we understand the four conversations. So let's finish with this. So we're wrapping up guys. We've committed to self mastery. We understand that not everything matters equally and it's up for me to decide what my priorities are. I'm going to need to adopt some focus and some structure so that I don't approach things entrepreneurially and typically get what I've always gotten. I'm going to purposely put my plan into place so that I learn as I earn as opposed to making it this occasional event that happens once in a while. It's going to be a consistent growth and learning plan. You're going to look for constructive ways to remove your limiting beliefs. And you're going to be accountable with a 411 and have an accountability coach, uh, partner, or plug in. Uh, I'm sure Janice would do this. I meet with a number of my agents for 15 minute check in once a week. They fill out a um, kind of turn in their numbers and we just review it. We focus on what's the thing they need to work on the most this week to make next week amazing. That's it. And I'm telling you, it's had a ton of success with us. Janice, are you, are you free to meet with your top 20, 30 agents for 15 minutes? I mean. I was just booking it with some, booking that exact thing with somebody in a private chat. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm really fortunate that, you know, Sunny meets with about 30, 40 of my agents. Uh, on Tuesdays, and I do a whole whack of them on Fridays. Some of them graduate to where we only do it every other week, and some of them have moved on to MAPS coaching. But man, we are connected, and we're at risk for the outcome, and they feel like we're pouring into them, and we are, and it creates a real win-win. So, you know, not everybody needs to get it from me. Not everybody needs to listen to Sunny. Like, they bounce off each other, and some of them find other avenues, but we want them to get that. Guys, we're closing up. What are you getting from today? What item in your notes are you going to take forward and move forward with? What positive action steps are you going to take?
Anybody? No, I've got sounds of silence on my playlist. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, well, think you know what maybe, maybe um I, I i've just reached out to janice to set up accountability and mastermind yay. group and all that <laughs> and kathy <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you kathy <laughs> you're welcome most welcome and thank you so much for this afternoon it was very um informative and enlightening awesome thank you very much thanks billy for your notes in the chat thanks david Anybody else with some um, ahas that they're going to take away from today? Any notes they took that they felt, I get that. I'm going well, to use that. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I think the 411 um, is pretty important to accompany a business plan. And it's just, it's, just a, it's just a good fit to your business plan, as opposed to looking at the entire business plan every single day. You have this nice 411 that you can put up on your wall and it's there, right? Or you can take it with you. So I think the 411 would be something that um, kind of you, you, you kind of touched on there. Yeah. Every, everything else, there's just so much more to do. Yes. If I'm going to pick one thing, I'll probably pick the 411 yeah. and, and work from there as opposed to doing everything you said. Because then I just feel like going to bed. Yeah. So that's why that's what we're going to do. Well, thanks. For that. Not with you, Stephen. I'm just talking about going to bed. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, okay. There's nothing wrong with that. What you're doing is you're drilling down and you're going small. Yes. And almost all major success breakthroughs are um, by going small, not by going broad. Go deep and specific, and the 411 will help you on that. I'll get a follow-up email out to um, Irene with uh, a survey monkey. Uh, we'd like to get some feedback on the course, what you took from it, how we could better deliver it. It's always a challenge, certainly online. Um, I can't wait to be back in a classroom where we can interact a little bit more. Um, but in the meantime, I, I appreciate you guys jumping in. Um, any other closing thoughts before we are done? Stephen, I just want to thank you for your time and sharing with us. Uh, you've been awesome as always. Not that there was ever any question. Yeah, and we really you. appreciate you you sharing everything. I'm I'm hoping I'm I'm seeing some nice uh, thank you messages in in the chat. So uh, thank you guys for giving us your time as well. And uh, we'll see you. you out there. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank okay. Thank Bye everybody. Bye bye.